רחלי, עשר אמרנו זה המעבר של יוכן, נכון? לא, זה שבע. שבע A ושבע B זה בעצם ה-hands on. אז מצגת מספר עשר של מי אמורה להיות? היא אמורה להיות של... רק שנייה. אה, הוא בעצם היחידי שחסר לנו. בדיוק. מתחיל באות P. אנחנו מחכים לזה. כן, תריק. בדיוק. יש לנו הכל למעט המצגת הזאת. אוקיי. Okay. התחלנו את היוטיוב לייב. אז uh, אני ממשיך פה את ההקלטה, אנחנו למעשה עוד שנייה מתחילים, נכון? כן, אתם יכולים להקרין כבר את ה... כן. הנה יוכן בא. יוכן? Do you want to put the movie in the beginning? I will start recording, resume yeah. recording. Yeah. Good luck to us. Good luck. Recording in progress. As we proceed towards a climate neutral 2050, we are reaching the point where we put theory into practice, especially when it comes to hydrogen. So far, European efforts concerning hydrogen have been individual initiatives for the most part. The time has come for an integrated approach to gather our best ideas and put them to work in an actual region. The European Union has identified the Northern Netherlands as Hydrogen Valley. That's not surprising. In one ride, you'll find everything you need for a green, hydrogen-based economy. Sustainable energy sources, generation, storage, transport, as well as applications in industry and applications in mobility and our day-to-day -day environment. This time, the project partners are not researchers. They are makers. They will make the hydrogen economy flow. To achieve this, the project comprises of four clusters and will be realized by the end of 2025. With the region's green power converted to hydrogen, we will be working on storage and infrastructure, making hydrogen a raw material for our industry turning hydrogen into heat and power for residential areas. And it will give us mobility, green mobility. This sectoral integration is rarely seen. We are doing it right in this valley. We are progressing on some 30 sub-projects we have prepared over the past two years, hand in hand with public and private parties. We're working hard to set an example for Europe to follow Hydrogen Valley.
As we proceed towards a climate neutral 2050, we are reaching the point where we put theory into practice, especially when it comes to hydrogen. So far, European efforts concerning hydrogen have been individual initiatives for the most part. The time has come for an integrated approach to gather our best ideas and put them to work in an actual region. The European Union has identified the Northern Netherlands as Hydrogen Valley. That's not surprising. In one ride, you'll find everything you need for a green hydrogen-based economy, sustainable energy sources, generation, storage, transport, as well as applications in industry and applications in mobility and our day-to-day -day environment. This time, the project partners are not researchers. They are makers. They will make the hydrogen economy flow. To achieve this, the project comprises of four clusters and will be realized by the end of 2025. With the region's green power converted to hydrogen, we will be working on storage and infrastructure, making hydrogen a raw material for our industry, turning hydrogen into heat and power for residential areas, and it will give us mobility, green mobility. This sectoral integration is rarely seen. We are doing it, right in this valley. We are progressing on some 30 sub-projects we have prepared over the past two years, hand in hand with public and private parties. We're working hard to set an example for Europe to follow Hydrogen Valley. As we proceed towards a climate neutral 2050, we are reaching the point where we put theory into practice, especially when it comes to hydrogen. So far, European efforts concerning hydrogen have been individual initiatives for the most part. The time has come for an integrated approach to gather our best ideas and put them to work in an actual region. The European Union has identified the Northern Netherlands as Hydrogen Valley. That's not surprising. In one ride, you'll find everything you need for a green hydrogen-based economy, sustainable energy sources, generation, storage, transport, as well as applications in industry and applications in mobility and our day-to-day -day environment. This time, the project partners are not researchers. They are makers. They will make the hydrogen economy flow. To achieve this, the project comprises of four clusters and will be realized by the end of 2025. With the region's green power converted to hydrogen, we will be working on storage and infrastructure, making hydrogen a raw material for our industry turning hydrogen into heat and power for residential areas. And it will give us mobility, green mobility. This sectoral integration is rarely seen. We are doing it, right in this valley. We are progressing on some 30 sub-projects we have prepared over the past two years, hand in hand with public and private parties. We're working hard to set an example for Europe to follow Hydrogen Valley. As we proceed towards a climate neutral 2050, we are reaching the point where we put theory into practice, especially when it comes to hydrogen. So far, European efforts concerning hydrogen have been individual initiatives for the most part. The time has come for an integrated approach to gather our best ideas and put them to work 
in an actual region. The European Union has identified the Northern Netherlands as Hydrogen Valley. That's not surprising. In one ride, you'll find everything you need for a green, hydrogen-based economy, sustainable energy sources, generation, storage, transport, as well as applications in industry and applications in mobility and our day-to-day -day environment. This time, the project partners are not researchers. They are makers. They will make the hydrogen economy flow. To achieve this, the project comprises of four clusters and will be realized by the end of 2025. With the region's green power converted to hydrogen, we will be working on storage and infrastructure, making hydrogen a raw material for our industry, turning hydrogen into heat and power for residential areas, and it will give us mobility, green mobility. This sectoral integration is rarely seen. We are doing it, right in this valley. We are progressing on some 30 sub-projects we have prepared over the past two years, hand in hand with public and private parties. We're working hard to set an example for Europe, to follow Hydrogen Valley. As we proceed towards a climate neutral 2050, we are reaching the point where we put theory into practice, especially when it comes to hydrogen. So far, European efforts concerning hydrogen have been individual initiatives for the most part. The time has come for an integrated approach to gather our best ideas and put them to work in an actual region. The European Union has identified the Northern Netherlands as Hydrogen Valley. That's not surprising. In one ride, you'll find everything you need for a green, hydrogen-based economy, sustainable energy sources, generation, storage, transport, as well as applications in industry and applications in mobility and our day-to-day -day environment. This time, the project partners are not researchers. They are makers. They will make the hydrogen economy flow. To achieve this, the project comprises of four clusters and will be realized by the end of 2025. With the region's green power converted to hydrogen, we will be working on storage and infrastructure, making hydrogen a raw material for our industry turning hydrogen into heat and power for residential areas. And it will give us mobility, green mobility. This sectoral integration is rarely seen. We are doing it, right in this valley. We are progressing on some 30 sub-projects we have prepared over the past two years, hand in hand with public and private parties. We're working hard to set an example for Europe to follow Hydrogen Valley. As we proceed towards a climate neutral 2050, we are reaching the point where we put theory into practice, especially when it comes to hydrogen. So far, European efforts concerning hydrogen have been individual initiatives for the most part. The time has come for an integrated approach to gather our best ideas and put them to work in an actual region. The European Union has identified the Northern Netherlands as Hydrogen Valley. That's not surprising. In one ride, you'll find everything you need for a green, hydrogen-based economy, sustainable energy sources, generation, storage, transport, 
as well as applications in industry and applications in mobility and our day-to-day -day environment. This time, the project partners are not researchers. They are makers. They will make the hydrogen economy flow. To achieve this, the project comprises of four clusters and will be realized by the end of 2025. With the region's green power converted to hydrogen, we will be working on storage and infrastructure, making hydrogen a raw material for our industry, turning hydrogen into heat and power for residential areas, and it will give us mobility, green mobility. This sectoral integration is rarely seen. We are doing it, right in this valley. We are progressing on some 30 sub-projects we have prepared over the past two years, hand in hand with public and private parties. We're working hard to set an example for Europe, to follow Hydrogen Valley. Yes. 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 Vamos con el medio Good morning, goedemorgen, bokeel tov. My name is Racheli Kreisberg, and I warmly welcome you to the Hydrogen Valley Summer School, which takes place Tuesday till Thursday from 10 till 3 o'clock Israeli time, 9 till 2 o'clock Central European time. The summer school was co-organized by my colleague Jochen Burenkamp from Energy Delta Institute and a new energy coalition and myself. I serve as innovation attaché at the Netherlands Embassy in Israel and I'm part of the Netherlands Innovation Network. We will start with the opening words of His Excellency Hans Dokter, the Netherlands Ambassador to Israel. Ambassador Hans Dokter served in Israel since August 2019. Before his appointment to Israel, he was the Director for Sustainable Economic Development and Ambassador for Private Sector and Development Cooperation at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in The Hague. Hans Dokter was Dutch Ambassador to Ghana, Ivory Coast, Liberia, Sierra Leone, and Togo from 2013 to 2016. He has a degree in law from the University of Amsterdam. Thank you, uh, Recheli. Um, <coughs> welcome uh, to everyone to this uh, uh, summer school on hydrogen. And um, the temperatures are, uh, are high at the moment uh, here in Israel and uh, all, all around uh, Europe. 
and uh, so to talk about this refreshing subject is uh, is I think a great uh, way to spend our time. Uh, also because um, yeah, the hydrogen um, sector uh, can play an important role in in the energy transition that we're all working towards. And since the publication of the the latest uh, climate report, it has become even more uh, clear that uh, we need to work harder and, and move faster to uh, yeah to meet our climate goals and um, reforming our 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 energy sector and uh, getting our energy needs from different clean sources uh, is vital and that's why it's uh, it's really excited that uh, that in the coming two days we talk about um, hydrogen and the examples uh, that we are developing in the netherlands and in particular in the north of the netherlands in uh, europe's uh, one and only hydrogen valley where uh, we're concretely working uh, to have by 2025 uh, a working ecosystem uh, that uh, provides uh, both production as well as uh, transport uh, as, and, and all the other needs uh, that we have to uh, to to have a functioning ecosystem to to fully benefit from uh, from green hydrogen and we think that's an exciting uh, example uh, that uh, we want to share with uh, partners in europe and globally and uh, and also here in israel uh, where we also see uh, under the new government real appetite to, uh, to move faster to meet uh, uh, the climate goals and to uh, speed up the energy transition. And uh, we have seen with previous uh, events that we organized and that I said we organized, that there's a lot of appetite uh, here in Israel to, um, yeah, to do something similar and, and build a, a hydrogen ecosystem um, that uh, is based more on solar energy um, and, uh, and, and less on wind as we do in the Netherlands, but still um, uh, a very similar um, uh, setup can be achieved uh, here as well to, to make sure that we have hydrogen for uh, those uh, energy needs that solar alone cannot uh, provide for, for transport, particularly heavy transport, um, but also for uh, energy generation, for cooling or uh, any other needs. Um, so yeah, we think it's really exciting to share our experiences from the Netherlands um with our friends in israel and um yeah we hope that uh, uh yeah when moving forward we can connect uh, the hydrogen ecosystems in different countries together in a global uh, network because uh, that is of course the big problem a uh, big uh, promise of hydrogen that uh, it's transportable and uh, and if we have the right uh, infrastructure uh, in europe in our region and israel in its region and you connect um, these uh, systems, then um, we uh, are, are building a health, healthy, thriving uh, hydrogen ecosystem, not just the valley, but uh, uh, connecting continents. So, of course, that is a long way uh, off, but um, we're, we're very privileged that, uh, that Acheli and, uh, and also Patrick Knobben, um, who is one of the main architects of uh, what we call Heaven with double N, the Northern Netherlands Hydrogen Valley Project, and, uh, and also, of course, Mark uh, Bonusconser, the managing director of the Eindhoven Institute for Renewable Energy uh, Systems, who is a real driving force uh, together with Acheli to make this uh, happen. Uh, so we're really pleased that they are uh, with us today to share their experiences and many others uh, from the Netherlands um, that uh, have hands-on experience in, uh, in making this, uh, this work. And uh, we're happy to share our um, experiences through the uh, Israeli-Dutch um, uh, uh, Innovation Center that, uh, that Acheli is, uh, is leading. We have a very active uh, advisory board that is, uh, that is involved in all of this. And um, yeah, we really feel that, uh, that we're laying the groundwork for, for close cooperation and sharing of knowledge and ideas uh, between uh, Israel and the Netherlands to, uh, to make this work. And we don't just do this between Israel and the Netherlands, of course. Uh, the Netherlands is a very international uh, economy, open economy, and we, uh, we feel this can only be done when we connect globally. I already mentioned we do this in the European context, uh, but also outside Europe, um, we need to connect uh, all the players uh, to, to come to a thriving green hydrogen sector. We know that uh, in Japan and in Korea, uh, 
they are also working very actively uh, on this transition, uh, but in many other places uh, in the world. So we, we try to connect and, uh, and we hope, of course, that the Netherlands that, that used to be an energy um, uh, hub in, uh, in Europe and still is uh, for gas and, and, and for other uh, fuels, we want to be that uh, hub also for, for green energy and for hydrogen in particular. So, um, so without further ado, I think we, we move on with the, with the program. Um, it's a summer school. Feel free um, uh, to, uh, to focus uh, on, on what we have to offer, participate actively and, uh, and, and come up with good ideas that you can take forward in your work and in your business in the future. So uh, I'm very happy to be with you today and uh, look forward to a great summer school. Thank you, Rafael. Back to you. Thank you very much, Hans. And now I'd like to introduce my colleague, Jochem Burenkamp. Jochem and I co-organized this course. This is not the first activity that we're co-organizing. We started already in September 2020 when we organized the first hydrogen course. Um, and since then, we have organized several Dutch-Israeli mini symposia also on energy transition and hydrogen-related uh, topics. Jochem served since 2017 as an energy analyst and a project manager at the New Energy Coalition, NEC. And he works as an energy and hydrogen analyst also at the business school of NEC and at the Energy Delta Institute. And as a project manager for the Heaven project that the ambassador just mentioned. Before he joined NEC, he was working at Costera and he has a strong background in business administration. Jochem, the floor is yours. Thank you, Racheli. Uh, let me all guide you through the program. Um, during this uh, three-day program, on we focus on hydrogen values. But before we do so, we walk through the, the entire hydrogen value chain, and that's what we're going to do today. Uh, Frank Wouters starts with, uh, with this by discussing the role of hydrogen in the energy transition. And from there, Leon Stiller will take over and discuss the next parts of this hydrogen value chain discusses the different production technologies uh, for producing gray, blue, and uh, green hydrogen, the transport and storage of hydrogen, and finally, the main end users, which are the industry and the mobility. And he uh, discusses whether it's a good idea to use our hydrogen for the built environment as well. Then we start introducing the topic of hydrogen valleys. Uh, Roland Berger, a large German consultancy has written a report on hydrogen valleys, uh, which some of you, I think, uh, have probably read by now, or at least part of it. And they will first, first introduce this, the, the concept of hydrogen valleys. And uh, uh, that's also an introduction for tomorrow, because tomorrow we're going to work on a case uh, in where we design our hydrogen valley. Uh, we end today uh, with a sh very short presentation from Achim Eversbecher who introduces uh, Horizon Europe to us. Uh, I think some of you are familiar, but it's a very important funding mechanism. And therefore we uh, make sure this is also uh, mentioned today. And that's about it for today's program. I will uh, introduce uh, tomorrow and the third day, uh, tomorrow and on the third day later. Uh, Racheli, I give the word back to you. Good luck all. Thank you. So what we would like to do now, originally we wanted to uh, each of you introduce yourself, but at the moment we have 117 people, so that's a bit much. But if you can please open your camera so that we can have a look and uh, maybe I will ask Avnel and Leo to help us make sure that we can all see each other in gallery view. Once you open your camera, then we will be able to see all of you. <clears throat> and I will then tell you a little bit who is here with us today. This is important to us because it's not to impress, but it is to show you that there's a lot of people from whom you will be able to learn uh, during our summer school. So I'll give you a few minutes just to open your camera. And we don't care uh, what you wear. It's a <laughs> summer school after all, so uh, you can be as uh, informal as, as you like. It's about the brains, not about the clothes or the hair. 
Great. Okay, so thank you. Okay, so a little bit about the people that are in the audience and who make up this summer school. 250 people registered in the course of uh, two months, which was really um, for us a great, um, um, it gave us a great feeling and knowing that we're doing something for which there is a need in the market. So that was the first thing. As Jochem already told you, we will also have hands-on um, based on a case study developed uh, by Jochem and myself uh, on the basis of the report of Roland Berger. And uh, in order to do that, we did ask you whether you would part, uh, take part at the, uh, the hands-on. And therefore, we learned also a little bit more about our participants. And that is something that I will uh, tell you so that you can see who you're working with today. Not only that we have great participants, we also have great speakers. We are 10 international speakers, um, some from the Netherlands, some from uh, uh, Roland Berger, um, the organization uh, that uh, we are basing our case study on in Germany, a speaker from Morocco, uh, Frank Wouters, who will talk soon, who is also uh, originally from the Netherlands, but who resides in Abu Dhabi uh, for the last 30 years as well as uh, Gideon Friedman uh, from Israel. So that is at the level of the speakers. Now, out of the um, participants, we have um, 115 people that will actively take part at the hands-on uh, exercise tomorrow. We will tell you a little bit more about the logistics uh, when we get to it tomorrow, but you will be working in small groups and uh, therefore you can then uh, interact and we also have a group of about 65 people that we call listeners, because uh, as we say in Hebrew, we learn by, by listening. It's very important to listen. So therefore, if you're a listener and at the moment you're not taking active part at the hands-on exercise, it is still a great opportunity for you to learn from the lectures. And Jochem and I, we will also share the feedback that we will receive from the people that are going to do the hands-on exercise. Feedback is a nice word for saying that there is going to be a home assignment, which will give you the opportunity to express in writing very shortly uh, what you have learned. Another important uh, aspect of the participants is the fact that we have 30% of uh, the participants are female. And this is very important to us at the embassy that we will maintain and try to reach gender equality. So um, this is something that uh, we wanted to share with you as well. And um, the uh, summer school is very international. It is true that the majority of people come from Israel. We have 80 participants from Israel, 40 participants from the Netherlands. And then we have another 32 participants from different countries, or I'll say it differently. We have participants from another 32 countries. Some are represented by a single person, some by two people and some maybe by three or four people. And this makes the summer school very international. And the reason that this is important for us here is that as Hans mentioned, the hydrogen valleys are maybe regional uh, ecosystems, but eventually they will have to be uh, connected globally. And therefore your involvement in the design and planning of a virtual uh, and theoretical hydrogen valley gives you the opportunity to already start making those contacts. Um, I just want to make sure that uh, Frank Wouters is already online. If you can help me with yes, that. Yes, he's not in, I see. Okay. So we will wait a second for Frank Wouters to join us, and then I will introduce him. In the meantime, we received a few questions in the chat. Uh, we will share the presentations um, of the speakers. And we are also recording this event live through YouTube. And after the um, <clears throat> event itself, we will share with you the link to the um, YouTube recording, which you can use in order to continue uh, learning about uh, what we have done in the last three days. We will not record the hands-on session, and therefore you will be able to feel very free within the group. And there is no recording of any of the uh, events taking place uh, in these uh, small groups. If there, are there any questions that people have, because we're now going to wait for our colleague Frank Wouters to join. Um, so if you want, you can ask Jochem and myself um, any questions that you have so that we will have a good start.
Okay, people that would like to join as listeners um, after we uh, finish this first part of the introduction, we will uh, make any effort to enable other people that pre-registered through Eventbrite to uh, join um, as listeners. That's a question that we received. Frank is coming. Yeah, Jochen. Yeah. maybe you can tell us a little bit about uh, the place where you work. I work at the embassy, but maybe it will inspire people when they will hear a little bit from you about the uh, New Energy Coalition and the Energy Delta Institute. Yes, I can indeed. Um, I'm working for the Energy Delta Institute, which is part of a new energy coalition. Uh, we've been merged a few years ago together with Energy Valley and Energy Academy. We focus on energy education and uh, energy projects. We start uh, and cooperate on, on, on a large uh, local um, projects, at least local oriented, um, uh, uh, but with international parties. One of these uh, large projects is the Heaven Project, of which uh, you've seen uh, the video in the beginning, but also um, which was shared uh, with the documents. Heaven is uh, the first integrated European hydrogen valley that also serves as a base for, uh, for uh, this summer school. Uh, Petra Knubben is a, is a colleague of ours. He will speak later about uh, uh, Heaven Project. We do not only focus on hydrogen, but we have a strong focus on it. We also work on, on projects, for example, on system integration and on green gas. Thanks. Uh, I assume that Frank Bout has joined. Frank, uh, if you can signal that you're here, because uh, there are so many people in the audience, uh, I want to be 100% sure that you're here before I introduce you. And you can also unmute yourself. Yes, Frank, I see you. Good morning. Great. Okay, so let's please introduce Mr. Frank Wouters, who has been leading sustainable energy projects, transactions, and technology development for over 28 years. He has played a lead role in development of renewable generation projects valued at over $4.5 billion. These range from small scale uh, photovoltaic solar electrification in Uganda to the 100 megawatt Sham One concentrated solar power plant in the United Arab Emirates, and strategic equity investment in the London Array, the world's largest offshore wind project. His transactions have received multiple project finance deal of the year awards. As Deputy General Director of the International Renewable Energy Agency, IRENA, the first global intergovernmental organization dedicated to all renewables, he managed a $350 million um, IRENA Abu Dhabi fund for development project facility for renewable energy. He appraised over 80 projects a year and recommended projects for funding, including solar uh, photovoltaic projects in Africa. Mr. Wouters has served on the board of several energy companies, including Torresol Energy, where he developed three solar plants with an overall budget of over $1.4 billion. Mr. Wouters has a proven track record of advice to public power sector agencies. He currently serves as global lead green hydrogen at Worley. He is director at the EU GCC Clean Energy Technology Network, and he is a director of Gore Street Capital London. He is advising the World Bank on solar energy around the world, and he is a fellow of the Payne Institute, Colorado School of Mines, qualified with a Master of Science in Mechanical Engineering from Delta University in the Netherlands. We could not have asked for a better um, speaker to open the summer school. Frank, the floor is yours. Yes, thank you, uh, Rachili. Uh, let me start sharing the screen. And let me know whether that works. Can you all see my screen? Yes, yes. you can. Good stuff. So yes. first of all, let, let me thank, thank you for, for inviting me. It's a, it's a real pleasure. Um, a small 
correction though, I, I'm currently, I left Worley. I'm, I'm, I'm senior vice president uh, at Reliance working on energy transition and, and hydrogen is a big part of that. Uh, let me also, even though um, a long time ago once, uh, somebody told me that you should never apologize when doing presentation because it makes people feel bad. But I do want to apologize for the title because I don't think why hydrogen is a good question. It should actually be why not hydrogen uh, because I think it's completely unavoidable. It's something that we're going to have to work with. Uh, so that would have been actually the, the, the title of my choice. But um, let me start. Um, I don't think we need to go through this. Um, the flow of, of today's lecture will be that first we'll take a step back and look at what the energy transition uh, actually is. Then we'll, we'll focus on the role of hydrogen within the energy transition. Then, um, you know, hydrogen in Europe, it's the hotspot, if you will. Uh, of many things, hydrogen. Uh, I think it's it's important that we understand some system aspects of hydrogen. There's a lot of confusion about that. Um, then we'll look at the market, and lastly, uh, we'll focus uh, a little bit on, on projects. And after that, obviously, I'll be uh, open for, for Q&A. Frank, if I can disturb you for a sec. Please, go ahead. Okay, maybe we can improve a little bit um, your mic so that uh, we can hear you a little bit better. Maybe Avmel and Leo can help you with this adjustment as uh, the audio is not perfect. You can step away a little bit from the mic. Uh, under his desk, I think. <laughs> <laughs> can you hear me now? Avmel, can you check? No, no, let me, let me just um, try. What, you lower the mic? Can you lower the mic level a little bit? Uh, okay. Let me try. So to speak. More, or be at a, more of a distance from your mic. What about this? Does it, uh, is this better? It is? Which is more? Can, can, is this better now? I'm using my AirPods. Yes. Otherwise, it can. Yes. Better? And also from the audience, you get lots of positive feedback. So sorry for disrupting you, but uh, we can continue. Is it good now? Because I could also yes. try the the, the 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 laptop mic. Okay. Let let's uh, let's and let me know. Uh, we can also uh, still change to the the the, the laptop. Good. So um, good. Now. This is something that um, you know has been been with us for um, you know let's say the last um, uh, forty years. And uh, if if I look at what uh, the cost of of a solar panel was when I was a teenager, it's gone three hundred times cheaper now than it was then. And and right now, and this is what we'll see later, is uh, you know solar is is uh, you know on a on a per unit uh, cost comparison the cheapest form of, of electricity in most places in, in the world right now. And this was not even the case 10 years ago. 10 years ago, it was still expensive. We were still debating why, why solar now, it's why hydrogen, because, uh, because it, um, you know, it, it went through this rapid uh, cost decline. There's a few things that, uh, that made this happen. First of all, uh, solar is made from readily available materials. Silicon is, is you know, abundant on the planet. We just need to refine it and make it work as a solar, uh, as a solar device, but it's, it's there. Um, we we managed to increase efficiencies, and most of all, we managed to basically um, you know increase supply, uh, you know reach the massive uh, economies of scale, etc. But it's not just solar. We're also looking at wind, and mind you, this this graph stops at 2019, but the cost uh, uh, decline hasn't stopped. So also, wind in a good location is now undercutting the cost of fossil fuels. And uh, this is a recent uh, cost comparison. You see the gray band at the bottom, which is the global average uh, fossil fuel cost range. And then if you look at solar photovoltaic to the left and then onshore wind, uh, the, the, the second one from the right, both are now on average cheaper um, than you know, the cost range for fossil fuels. And this changes everything. And again, 10 years ago, this was not the case. Uh, I, I have a personal experience. I built um, the Shams uh, power plant in Abu Dhabi. That was 10 years ago. At the time, by some margin, the most expensive uh, power in the Emirates of Abu Dhabi. And if I look at, uh, you know, the world record low 
prices that are being achieved in Abu Dhabi is by a huge margin, the cheapest form of power. So within 10 years, you go from something that's uh, on, on the high end of the cost range to something that is by a huge margin, the cheapest, and that changes everything. And these are, you know, this is where we are right now. These are, these are averages. They're, they're not even the world record. They're, they're really, really low. Uh, solar you can do for, for less than a dollar cent per kilowatt hours now. And this is what it looks like if, if you then compare that and, and you look at tipping points where on a cost basis, you compare the cost of fossil fuel levelized costless electricity. Um, and, and the interesting bit is that, um, you know, we, uh, if, if you look at, at number one, there the renewable levelized costless electricity, um, you know, started being better and lower than the fossil fuel levelized cost of electricity. But then if you look at the lower, uh, the, the, the lower curve, which is the cash cost of, uh, of, of fossil fuel operations, which is basically the fuel cost plus some other OPEX. So you disregard the fact that you have to make the capital uh, expend, expenditure. But even right now, you know, we're at, at the point where uh, in many locations, new renewable electricity is cheaper than running an existing coal-fired or otherwise power plant just on the basis of the fuel cost. So what is happening is that obviously, um, you know, we're, we're shutting off um, uh, coal-fired power plants and, you know, gas-fired power plants are also under immense pressure. This is just cheaper to, to replace that with, uh, with solar and wind. And then if you add, if you're going forward and you add batteries, which increases the LTOE of renewables uh, a, a little bit, but you, it's more useful, it's got more value to the system, because you have more hours that you can actually serve with renewable electricity, then, then that also going forward uh, in the coming years will be able to, to basically push uh, fossil fuel uh, investments out of the market. Now, some people think, okay, that, that's all great, but you know, do we have enough sunshine? Do we have enough wind? Where do we have it? And if you do the big numbers, then you know, if, if you were, and this, these are of course thought experiments, if, if you were to, you know, conceive of, of um, you know, building all the solar that you need for the worldwide energy demand in, in Australia, you would need about 10% of Australia or 8% of the Sahara Desert covered in solar panels. That would give you enough energy, um, you know, to supply the world's energy demand. So in terms of theoretical potential, there's, there's not, not a single issue with that. Of, of course, you wouldn't do that, but it, it just shows the order of magnitude that, uh, that the potential for solar is. And, and the same for wind, if you, would to, if you were to cover one and a half percent of the Pacific Ocean with um, offshore wind uh, turbines, uh, that, that would also give you enough electricity, or actually energy for the, for the entire planet. Uh, this, this is not electricity, this is, this is energy, so it, it covers everything. Uh, again, you wouldn't do that, but it just shows you the, the potential. So there is enough uh, renewable energy on the planet uh, to, uh, to cover our, our demand. There's no, there's no issue with that. Now, where we do have to also change the mindset, and this is something that if you, if you hear somebody talk about baseload, uh, that's really 20th century thinking. Uh, so this is, a typical, this is a typical daily load cycle where you know, at night you have low demand, there's always something running, but then during the day, people go to work, factories open, et cetera. In, in the evening, people start cooking and there is more demand for, for, for lighting, et cetera. So you have an evening peak and then it goes down again when people stop working and go to bed. And basically the way how you cover that with an electricity system is you have three layers of, of generation. One is what we call base load. It's coal, pulver, pulverized coal, typically very inflexible uh, or nuclear stuff that has to run all the time uh, in their economic modeling or for technical reasons because nuclear is just very difficult to switch off. Those are must run um, you know, generators. Then you have a band in the middle, um, you know, basically for the day, for the day uh, where you have typically natural gas combined cycle units that are, you know, in terms of number of hours that you need to run them somewhere in between. Uh, and then you have a few hundred hours every year where you have a peak and you cover that with something that's cheap to build, typically gas turbines or gas motors with a very high cost of electricity, but they're cheap to to build and overall that's the cheapest option for a few hundred hours that you need to cover that peak. Now, this is when you had a system that was based on uh, basically fossil fuels or nuclear. Now, what we're having now 
is a system that is increasingly dominated by renewables. And even though we've seen that renewables are cheap uh, and you know they're getting cheaper and cheaper all the time, and because of that, they're pushing uh, conventional out of the market. We've seen that in the next couple of years, even the cash cost of uh, existing coal and gas will be pushed out of the market by renewables. Uh, still, you know, you're weather dependent. You know, you don't have, you never have sunshine at night, and you don't, you don't have wind all the time. But the fact is that in the merit order, because it, it's mostly capex, so you pay for a solar panel, you pay for a wind turbine. The running costs are negligible. In the merit order, in an electricity system, they come first because you've already paid for it. So the marginal costs going forward are zero. So if you have something else that costs something because you have a fuel cost you still take the solar power or the wind power uh, when, when it's there, because it doesn't make sense from an economic point of view not to take that into your system. So that then de facto becomes your new baseload, if you will. And again, you know, I warn everybody not to use the term baseload because it's really 20th century. But, but the fact is that in the merit order, solar and wind are the new you know, base of your electricity system. That is what you take because you've already paid for it. Marginal cost is zero. So then everything else that, that has to come on top to basically serve your daily demand peak or a, a profile has to be flexible. There has to be elements of storage. There has to be uh, dispatchable power, all the stuff that we, that we need to make a system work that's to some extent less predictable than, than we had before because of the weather dependency, et cetera. hydrogen and what that means in, in the energy transition. Now, many things we like to say uh, are not rocket science. Actually, hydrogen is rocket science. The big brown cigar, uh, you know, at the bottom of the space shuttle is full of liquid hydrogen, uh, you know, with a tank of liquid oxygen. Uh, and, and it's a very powerful fuel, fuel per, per weight, per unit of weight. It's four times, got four times more energy than kerosene, uh, which is another type of rocket fuel. So hydrogen is certainly, you know, pretty suitable to shoot rockets into space. Now, how do we make hydrogen? You know, the, the bulk of the hydrogen is currently made through steam methane reforming of natural gas. So natural gas is CH4. Um, you, you run steam through that, uh, and then you basically crack, you crack it into its components. Although the, the C, the carbon, you know, is, is connected to oxygen and you get CO2. But 95% of all current uh, hydrogen production is either steam methane reforming of natural gas or, or coal gasification. Uh, and it's pretty dirty. We have nine to 10 kilos of CO2 emissions for each kilo of hydrogen. So we need to clean that up. Otherwise we, we cannot you know, use this in an energy system of the future, which has to be decarbonized. But it's, you know, again, uh, proven technology, tech, technology readiness level of nine. Now, if we were to clean that up, we can, of course, capture the CO2 and then uh, we store that. Um, and and then, then we have a clean product, the cleaner product uh, of hydrogen without you know, the heavy carbon footprint. It's not possible to, to capture everything and store everything. Uh, but of course, it's much better than the, the 10 kilos per uh, you know, the kilo of hydrogen produced for the CO2. It will be much, much less. You know, there's a range of that. So we have to look into that, and that's part of the current debate. You know, how do you account for that? How do you, you know, define actually what kind of blue hydrogen we're having? This is part of an international debate, so we better understand what kind of carbon footprint we have in in blue hydrogen. And lastly, um, green hydrogen is if we uh, split water H2O into its two components, hydrogen and oxygen, uh, we can do that fairly simply with an electrolyzer, the chemical device that runs electricity through water and it splits the water molecule. If the electricity is green, we call the hydrogen green. And, and this is perhaps something that, that you remember. I, I used to do this at, at, at secondary school. Uh, the, the, the chemistry teacher made us uh, basically put two electrodes in a glass of water and run a current through it. And we saw little bubbles on one and bubbles on the other. One was oxygen, the other one was hydrogen. And an electrolyzer at industrial scale is basically the same. It's the same principle, um, you know, as that, um, you know, high school ex experiment. Um, but obviously, we need some some more things. We need compression. We need water demineralization, gas treatment, and 
some of the components to make an industrial gas at the quality that, that is required. And to your right is, um, you know, it's, it's an artist impression of a, of a Nell unit, one of the major manufacturers of, of electrolyzers. And it's also not new. I mean, electrolysis, uh, this is, um, these are some pictures uh, from Norway, but similar uh, systems we had uh, in Zimbabwe and Egypt, you know, everywhere we, we, where we built large hydro power dams, people used to make hydrogen uh, using uh, electrolyzer, and then the hydrogen we used was used to make ammonia. So you take nitrogen from air and you combine it with the hydrogen, you make ammonia, which is NH3, which is fertilizer or base material for fertilizer. Um, and and this, this was actually the main, um, you know, technology to produce hydrogen before we started uh, uh, using natural gas as a feedstock. So when that came up, that was just easier to do, cheaper to do than this. Uh, but, you know, again, electrolysis is not new, also not at scale. So we've, we know how to do that. Now, there's a cost um, uh, question at the moment. Uh, we've seen the cost curves for, for solar and for wind. Uh, and we will see something similar for hydrogen. And why will that be similar? First of all, it's, it's based on technology. So an electrolyzer is made from, you know, mostly it depends a little bit on the technology. It's mostly readily available materials. Uh, there is some where you have some exotic materials, but it's not necessary. So you can actually, you know, going forward, uh, conceive what you, what you call a learning curve. So with every doubling of capacity, you know that there is a certain reduction in, in the cost for, for solar that's around 21% for hydrogen. It's not yet known, but you know, there's some expectation it will be around 18%. So every doubling of capacity of manufacturing capacity of electrolyzers, they will become 18% cheaper. Uh, and going forward, then it depends, of course, on how many electrolyzers we build. But if I look at all the plants, then these are some of the numbers that the IEA uh, put out two years ago. Uh, they say $1 per kilo by 2040 on average uh, is conceivable. Then you're talking to $9 per MMBTU for natural gas, which is basically in the money for many, many places in the world. Not everywhere, but there is places like India, like, um, like Japan, Korea, where they pay these kind of prices. But even going further down, uh, down the line, Bloomberg said that it, it, it's easy to make even $80 cents per kilo of hydrogen. And then you're at, at $6 per MMBTU. And again, then you're you know, in, in more and more areas where you're competitive on a, on a pure, uh, you know, price point with, with natural gas. Yeah. Now, um, the seven typical roles of hydrogen in the energy transition uh, are depicted here. There's a picture from, uh, from McKinsey done for the Hydrogen Council. Uh, first of all, it's an enabler for large scale renewable integration and power generation. As, as I've, I've shown you on that daily demand profile picture, you know, you have the base of, of solar and wind, but you need flexibility uh, to, to meet the daily demand profile. Hydrogen is one of those things. It's very cheap to transport hydrogen over long distances, much cheaper than electricity. You can do that in gas pipes. I'll get to that little later. You can actually store a gas loss-free over a season, which is not something that we do for electricity or we don't have the technology for electricity to do that, but it's very cheap and easy to do for hydrogen. And then the more the four to the right, the four use cases, uh, we can decarbonize transportation, which is what some like to call, um, you know, the least compressible, uh, you know, sectors in, in the economy. It's, it's, it's been, you know, difficult to decarbonize transportation much, uh, but hydrogen can certainly do that, of course, in addition to electric mobility. Uh, industrial energy use, major one, uh, also in the short term, uh, building heating and power and, and hydrogen can be a feedstock, for example, for ammonia, but also steel, steel making and other things, you know, jet fuel. There's all kinds of things where hydrogen, uh, you know, can do things that, for example, electricity can't, because there's some confusion that we can do everything with electricity, but we can't. We can, it's, you need molecules for certain things. And, you know, then if, if you're looking at, you know, what kind of fuels um, can, can we think of in the mix, then, um, you know, you start with electricity, and that's either hydropower or high, water and solar and wind. Uh, you combine that to make uh, in an electrolyzer uh, hydrogen. Uh, then if you add an air separation unit, you take nitrogen uh, from air, also using green electricity that can be done, and you can make green ammonia. Uh, but you can also liquefy hydrogen uh, if you need carbon, because certain fuels are 
difficult without carbon, for example, jet fuels, um, you know, they have aromatic um, molecules that, that always have carbon. Of course, you can also run uh, a plane on hydrogen or even ammonia or other things, but uh, jet fuel is, would be uh, an option to make a drop in jet fuel from, from green molecules. You would probably need, need to direct air capture and take the CO2 from air. And then you can bind that into more complex molecules such as uh, synthetic jet fuel, that's all possible. Now, let's, let's look at Europe. Europe is um, you know, the hotspot of hydrogen activities, uh, I, I can say. Um, and then you know, I have the numbers for Germany in 2020, uh, and it's a prototype for, for Europe. If you, if you want to have a high level comparison, just, just multiply everything by five and you have, you have Europe. But, but Germany had um, um, you know, 513 terawatt hours uh, of electricity demand last year. Um, but it had about um, almost 2,000 terawatt hours of molecules. And this is something that we need to understand because you know, people get very excited about electricity. Because if you look at last year, it was the first year in the history of, of Germany, but it was the same for Europe, that we had more than 50% renewable power in the electricity mix, which is of course great. And you know, that's driven by ever, ever cheaper electricity uh, with solar panels and, and wind turbines and, and also biomass and hydro. Um, but, but, but electricity is only 20% of all final energy. Uh, and we still have 80% of molecules and that is coal for electricity, that is diesel, that is um, you know, coal for steel making. So the molecules, which are 80% um, of uh, our final energy demand in, in Europe and in Germany, um, there we haven't done uh, as, as well as with electricity. Uh, we have 9% um, renewable uh, molecules in the mix, and that's mostly biofuels, you know, diesel, uh, and, and, and those kinds of things, uh, and biomass for electricity. But, um, uh, but, but that's 80%, and there we've, we've done, you know, not as much as in the, in, in the electricity sector. So what do we need to do? First of all, uh, we, need to, we need to continue uh, increasing the share of, of uh, green electricity in the electricity mix, which, you know, it, it's relatively straightforward. We know how to do that. We have the technology. We know it's cost effective, et cetera. You know, we do need to think about, uh, you know, the stranded assets that we will have because we are pushing uh, coal and gas systems and, and nuclear power plants out of the system just based on economic realities. Uh, so that needs some thought, but, you know, that is something that we need to do. But we also then... Uh, you know, considering that it's only 20%, we need to increase electricity. So one of well, the major elements of, of the uh, energy transition is massive electrification. We have to increase, because, you know, on the left side, it's easy to do, it's cheap uh, to, to green up the electricity sector. We also then need to do more with electricity, and we are doing that. We're, we're electrifying processes, we're electrifying transport, there's more and more electric vehicles in the mix, uh, et cetera, et cetera. But there is also limitations, um, and, and I think that um, you know, we will probably face a reality at, at 50% uh, electricity where it becomes a stretch to do more. But also clean molecules, of course, we need to clean that up. Now, let's um, fast forward uh, to 2050. Um, and I, I think the reality is at the moment that um, uh, green power is struggling uh, in, in Europe to some extent already uh, because of the lack of infrastructure. Germany pays more than a billion euro every year uh, to wind farm operators in the north of the country because they don't have uh, you know, the, the interconnectors uh, to the demand centers in the south of the country. And the same, we see that in many, many countries in, in, in the Netherlands and Belgium, et cetera. So that is a problem. And nobody wants over at power lines. We all want green electricity that will be largely solar in the south of Europe and, and offshore wind in the northwestern part of, of the continent. Uh, but we don't have the infrastructure, we don't have the power lines, etc. And that is just a lot more difficult to do. People are objecting, there's environmental concerns with over power lines, etc. So I think we're struggle, we'll struggle to go beyond 50%. But that, that already means that we have two and a half times more electricity than, uh, than we have right now. But let's, for, the, for, the, for argument's sake, let's Let's think about a, a system of 50% electricity, which is all clean in 2050, uh, and then 50% molecules, uh, which also have to be clean. Now, what are the options uh, for the molecules? Now, uh, we can do more biofuels. Uh, that's at the moment 9% of, of the 80%. So that is actually a sizable size chunk. 
but it's limited to, you know, to expand. We have environmental concerns. There is competition with food and, and all of that, monocultures, etc. cetera. Um, so I don't think there is, um, you know, unlimited growth potential there. Um, we, we can continue burn, uh, burning hydrocarbons, but then we'd have to capture the CO2 and store that. Again, uh, limited in the sense that we don't have um, you know, the capacity everywhere to do that. Uh, you also won't be able to capture 100%. That's always limited uh, in terms of potential. And then there's hydrogen, and th there's, no there's nothing else. At least if anybody knows of something else, then please let me know. But these are the options that, uh, that, that, that I see. And green hydrogen, uh, again, you can also turn it into ammonia, into methanol, other e-fuels, et cetera. Um, that has, you know, none of the disadvantages of, of the other two in the sense that it's a lot like solar. Uh, you can do it at a very small scale, decentralized to huge, massive centralized uh, systems uh, where your cost uh, structure is, um, is more competitive, et cetera. Uh, so in, in my view, it's a lot like solar PV. Uh, you know, the more you do it, the cheaper it gets, and you can do it everywhere and you know, at, at any scale that you like. So of those options, I think hydrogen is actually um, you know, a, a very clear favorite. Now, this, this idea, um, th this, you know, we, we thought about how, how to, to do this go forward, and we can see the vision uh, for Europe where you have 50% green electricity, 50% green hydrogen, uh, of which 50% would need to be imported, because I think that's another element that, that um, you know, needs some consideration. 50% um, uh, green hydrogen for Europe in 2050, for the 50% green electricity, we already need 2,000 gigawatts of solar power plus 650 um, gigawatts of wind. If you want to make as much green hydrogen as green electricity, you need to double that. So you need another 2,000 gigawatts of solar and another 650 gigawatts of wind. Uh, and that is just not, not in, in, in a densely populated uh, continent such as Europe, it's, it's not possible. Uh, so, th so you need to import. And I think this is a, a gr growing realization uh, Europe is talking to um, you know various countries in, in North Africa, the Middle East, etc., of importing hydrogen ammonia at scale, uh, and that's a vision that we laid down in a North Africa Europe hydrogen manifesto in 2019. The picture is uh, the guy with the beard is from Stimmermans, uh, executive vice president of the European Commission in charge of the Green Deal and the hydrogen strategy, and um, uh, we basically gave him a copy in 2019, and he's taken it on board. It's now part of. Uh, the European strategy that also import is, is, uh, is something that we need. Um, in, uh, on the 8th of July last year, uh, Europe released uh, its hydrogen strategy. Uh, it has a number of elements. First of all, there is a priority focus uh, on green hydrogen, but also acknowledgement uh, that we need blue just to get, to get us going, because you know, we don't have the renewable energy generation capacity for the hydrogen volumes that we need, uh, at least not in the short term. So we need to capture our CO2 from existing SMR units and, and, and all kinds of things to get us going. Uh, there's two targets, at least six gigawatts of electrolyzed by 2024 and at least 40 gigawatts installed by 2030, uh, but also 1 million ton uh, by 2024 and 10 million ton by 2030. And if you do the maths, then for example, the 40 gigawatts uh, in 2030 won't give you the 10 million tons. So that also is an acknowledgement that there is a need for import and uh, as well as a need for blue hydrogen in that mix. Um, and, you know, it's, it's big money. Uh, it's a huge um, infrastructure investment program uh, whereby it's also fair to say that the bulk of the money is actually for the uh, renewable generation capacity. It's not so much for the, uh, the electrolyzers because two thirds of the costs are uh, the cost of, uh, of electrolysis. Now, it took them a year because this was all rich in ambition, but very poor in policy detail. And for a year, we haven't seen much from the European Commission. Uh, but on the 14th of July, so a couple of weeks ago, uh, they released the Fit for 55 package. Uh, and uh, finally, they um, you know, also thought about hydrogen and the renewable energy directive, the recast thereof, which is a policy framework that dictates that anybody that sells fuels into the European Union has to have by 2030, 14% renewables in the mix. And there's a few options, mostly it's biofuels now, but more and more also hydrogen. So they did um, uh, include uh, a sub target for hydrogen. So off the 13%, 2.6% uh, is now there for hydrogen 
which corresponds to 3 million tons by, by 2030. Uh, but there is also uh, another very interesting um, element that industry that now uses hydrogen, such as the ammonia sector and the steel sector, they must have 50% green hydrogen by 2030, which is an additional 2.7 million ton. And the 5.7 million ton um, uh, corresponds to 40 gigawatts, which is you know the target that we had in the hydrogen strategy last year. So uh, they, they've done their homework, and uh, I think it's it's a lot clearer now what needs to be done. And mind you, if you're if you're a big ammonia producer uh, and you know that by 2030 you have to have 50% green hydrogen in the mix, which is you know your major feedstock, you, you need to start working now. So this is this is good. Now let's um, let's focus a little bit on system aspects of hydrogen because you know I still notice there's a lot of confusion uh, about uh, about hydrogen electricity and and you know what that all means. Uh, and you know it's to some extent um, you know caused by uh, you know people that are very well known you see on the left uh, a well-known car salesman Elon Musk who uh, who calls fuel cells full cells and calls them staggerly dumb and I'll, I'll, I'll let you know in the next slide why why he says that uh, obviously he, he makes and sells electric vehicles so there's an interest there but uh, Franz Timmermans, uh, Executive Vice President of the European Commission in charge of the Green Deal and the hydrogen strategy, calls hydrogen the rock star for new energies all around the world, especially in Europe. So how come that these people who are both not stupid have such differing uh, opinions? And part of it is the efficiency fallacy. And this is something that uh, especially you know, electric vehicle enthusiasts uh, like to point out, and they're not wrong, that if you start with a solar panel, and you charge a battery or an, in, in, a, in an electric vehicle, you drive, uh, and there's very few losses uh, in that. If you, if you want to do the same with hydrogen, and you start with um, uh, an electric panel, and then you make hydrogen in an electrolyzer, then you have to compress that, store that, you have to distribute that. Uh, then again, there's compression and storage and dispatch at the filling station. Then uh, you put it in your car where you again have to turn it into electricity in a fuel cell and then you drive. Obviously, uh, the, the right chain is a lot less efficient. There is more losses, etc. cetera. But uh, I, I think the major um, thing that people forget is that the input cost uh, is going to zero. I mean, the latest um, you know, world record prices for solar are now less than one cent per kilowatt hours. So compared to the old thinking where your input was a fossil fuel that always would go up in price over time, here we have an input cost that goes down uh, in time. So over time, we will get cheaper, which doesn't mean that efficiency doesn't count, but it doesn't count as much. So the old thinking about all these efficiencies and conversion steps, et cetera, is still important, but it's not as important as overall system cost. And this is where I think many people uh, you know, they, they don't get the big picture that it's, it's about overall system cost and we shouldn't only focus on individual conversion uh, efficiencies. Now, uh, if, if we then look at uh, two aspects, so infrastructure and storage, and this is where it becomes very clear. Uh, I, I've taken two pieces of infrastructure that uh, connect the Netherlands to uh, the UK. One is the Britnet cable, costs about half a billion euro, has a capacity of one gigawatt, and, and then transports eight terawatt hours uh, through that cable. And then there is a gas pipeline between the Netherlands and the UK, costs about half a billion euro, has a capacity of 15 gigawatts, and transport hence 120 terawatt hours. So for the same amount of money, a gas pipe is 10, 15 uh, times cheaper than an electricity cable. And then I haven't really addressed the fact that um, you know, it's difficult to build new electricity cables because nobody wants over power lines, you know, environmental permitting, et cetera. And the gas pipes we actually already have, especially in Europe, we have 200,000 kilometers of high pressure gas pipes that we can actually convert to accommodate hydrogen. So not, it's, not it's not just cheaper, it's, it's already there. So this is a major, major advantage of, um, uh, of hydrogen over electricity. Um, if we then look at, and, and yeah, this, this is the, the point I just made, we have 200,000 kilometers of high pressure gas grid. There's a multitude of that in the distribution sector where 
um, you know, with very, very minor costs, especially distribution, it's all AGPE pipes, you can use it for hydrogen, uh, the high uh, pressure gas grid, yeah, is, Two thirds, you can uh, very easily uh, convert to, uh, to to accommodate hydrogen. There's been plenty of studies done by DNVGL uh, for Germany, for France. Uh, Kiwa did the same in the Netherlands, uh, etc. Um, that, that that have looked at what do we need to do to to, to switch because there's some embrittlement in certain uh, steel qualities, but the by and large, most of this grid uh, can accommodate hydrogen. You do need to invest in, in compressors and flow meters, et cetera, different gas, probably need some derating, et cetera, but, but it's so much cheaper to use this than to, build, to have to build new, uh, that this is, this is a major, major advantage. And then if, if you look at storage, um, electricity storage, the only grid storage that we really have at scale uh, is pumped hydro. Uh, and then of course there are batteries, but batteries are typically hours, not not days or months, uh, Europe has several thousand terawatt hours of gas storage. Uh, that is months of, of consumption uh, in the winter uh, because, you know, the dependency, to, you know, to Russian gas and, you know, LNG imports is there. So uh, you want to be, you know, independent from whatever supply hiccup that you, that you may see. There is so, so there is thousands of terawatt hours underground gas storage, which we need. And we also need that in the future. Now, if our system is, is electricity and, and hydrogen, we also need to store hydrogen. Electricity, difficult to store over a season. Hydrogen, very, very easy. Uh, we know how to do that. It's been done in the UK and in, in, um, in, in the US. Uh, salt caverns, they're you know, throughout Europe uh, readily available. They don't cost that much. Uh, and it's an integral part of uh, the energy system uh, going forward. Because the reality is we will have more energy consumption like we have now in the winter time when we need more energy for heating and, and for lighting, uh, but we have the bulk of the generation in the, in the summertime, so we do need seasonal storage. Uh, also in the situation of hydrogen and electricity, uh, underground uh, salt cavern storage can be done, uh, and, and that cannot be done with electricity. So these, these two elements, the, the infrastructure advantage plus the storage advantage, they fully compensate for the efficiency losses in certain, you know, narrow focused uh, use cases that people like to, uh, you know, bring to the forefront and saying that hydrogen uh, is, is nonsense compared to electricity. Now, let's look at the market. Um, uh, it's, it, it's anybody's guess, really. I mean, this is, uh, you know, the, the hydrogen, the hydrogen councils, um, um, 2000 and I think it's already 17. Um, let me let me look at that. Um, the, the, where, where they basically said that uh, by 2030 um, we would have um, 78 uh, exajoules of, of uh, hydrogen uh, demand, uh, which um, uh, would be 19% uh, of all final energy. Uh, and, and then they made a breakdown where that would go, and it would go to transport, uh, you know, power, industry, and all the things that, that we've seen before. But it's a massive growth uh, traje trajectory. And, and to, to, to be fair, I, I think that's actually underestimating the potential. Um, you know, again, looking at the options uh, we have to decarbonize molecules, I think it will probably be more. But, you know, again, it's anybody's guess. 19% is huge. Um, it's a $2.5 trillion industry per annum, which is bigger than oil and gas combined right now. So I think this is a sort of middle of the road estimation of the size of the hydrogen economy in 2050. Uh, and I, you know, it's already bigger than oil and gas combined now. So it is, it's huge. And, and this is, um, you know, a, a current picture of um, how are, um, you know, trading oil. Uh, you see the, the, the big brown, Bubbles, Middle East, uh, you know, Russia and, and the United States. Uh, that, that's where, where where we get it from. And then, obviously, from the Middle East goes to Europe, goes to Japan, Asia Pacific, uh, Korea, uh, where they have, um, you know, the, the net importers. Europe is a net importer, will remain so. America is right now relatively balanced, um, and and all of this is going to change because what we're having the situation with hydrogen that um, you know, basically anybody can make hydrogen, so you're not geographically or ge geologically uh, confined to places where you have oil and gas, uh, but you can make it in Russia, you can make it in Canada, you can make it in Chile. Um, and the only thing that matters is probably the availability of land, the availability of renewable energy resource, proximity to markets, et cetera. 
So there's going to be a, a very, very different dynamic uh, going forward. Uh, Australia is, of course, you know, blessed with abundant land and great renewable energy resource, and they're close to Korea and Japan. So there is that dynamic. Chile has massive potential, but it's a bit uh, far away from ma major markets, North Africa, Middle East, closer to Europe, etc. I mean, all of this is th this is going to play out in, in the future, and it's going to change the geopolitics of energy. Uh, and it, it's it's super exciting, but also unknown territory. We don't know what's going to happen, who's going to make which investments on what basis, etc. Because you're going to have to invest those billions based on you know, potential off-takers in unknown markets. I mean, this is something that um, you know, will have to play out in the next couple of years. If you look at, um, uh, if, if, I mean, this picture tries to show how we're going to trade hydrogen, you know, to the left, um, this is how we make it. So you make uh, hydrogen an electrolyzer, you can make ammonia, but you can also compress it, use it uh, in a pipeline, um, or you, um, uh, an, an ammonia, you can, uh, actually, um, uh, you know, you put it in a truck, you could put it on a, on a vessel or even in containers. Um, and you can also make hydrogen liquid. I mean, there's a pilot project between uh, Japan and Australia where they're making liquid hydrogen in Australia and put it in a dedicated vessel uh, to Japan. So these are some of the options, but by far the cheapest is a pipeline, but often that doesn't apply, especially if you're, you know, want to ship uh, hydrogen or ammonia from the Middle East to Japan. You need you need to you know either liquefy it or uh, you know tie it to some to something or make ammonia. Uh, now this is a picture of the uh, to the left is a picture of the uh, the hydrogen vessel uh, that was built by Kawasaki together with Shell uh, that takes uh, you know liquid hydrogen from from Australia to Japan. It's a demonstrator, very small you know subscale, but it shows that it can be done. Uh, to your right is a picture of an artist rendering uh, of ammonia as a marine fuel. This is actually very interesting. Uh, many manufacturers, but also shipping companies are looking at this. Uh, ports are looking at it. Um, uh, ammonia, you know, has uh, a favorable uh, characteristic in the sense that it's liquid at minus 33 degrees rather than minus 253 degrees to uh, compare to liquid hydrogen. Uh, and you can actually burn it in, in, a, in a marine diesel engine. So uh, both MEN as well as Caterpillar have um, uh, developed dual fuel engines that can run uh, on, uh, on on hydrogen um, and uh, no, on, on, on heavy fuel oil and ammonia. Uh, in terms of um, uh, projects, um, this is a, a project tracker uh, that McKinsey does, and this is the latest uh, update. There is now 359 announced large-scale projects uh, with a, an investment volume of, of roughly half a trillion dollars, uh, of, um, and, and 150 billion of those are considered mature. That's where you have either done a front-end engineering design, or you've already reached uh, you know, financial close, or there is a very clear offtake situation, et cetera. Uh, of, of those 28 are giga scale, then there is 141 large scale, there's 96 in transport, uh, 56 integrated hydrogen valleys, and, and 38 uh, infrastructure projects. If, if you look at the bubbles, I mean, a lot of them in Europe, so half of those projects are actually in Europe. So it's certainly fair to say that Europe is the, you know, the hotspot of, uh, of hydrogen, but also a growing number of hydrogen projects in, in China. And let's look at, um, you know, the last is, is the four, if you will, prototypes of, of types of projects that, that we see. I think uh, the first one is relatively straightforward. It's captive. Most most of the hydrogen projects right now are captive. You have a steam methane reforming, uh, you know, where you make ammonia or in a refinery uh, or in a steel plant. Uh, and in most places, you know, an electrolyzer would replace an SMR unit or you would put it next to it. Uh, and a typical investment would be 100 to 300 million. A lot of these projects are around now also driven by favorable regulations such as the Renewable Energy Directive in Europe. Um, if you then look at, at hydrogen valleys, that is more like a, like a local ecosystem, uh, ge geologically, geographically confined, where you have, um, you, you have production and distribution and consumption of hydrogen in, in a you know, geographically defined area. Uh, and there's many hydrogen uh, valleys uh, in, 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 you know, in the world, the Hydrogen Valley Platform, H2V.EU, 
is a joint initiative by the fuel cells and hydrogen joint undertaking and mission innovation, which is part of the Clean Energy Ministerial. Uh, and there's already now 36 registered hydrogen valleys in 19 countries and typical investment, uh, let's say a billion. Um, pipelines, uh, next step up is if you convert uh, pipelines or build new ones, this is the picture of the Netherlands. Uh, we have two natural gas backbones from the Groningen, uh, the Schlochten gas fields uh, to the Rotterdam area and to uh, the, the, the Hoergebied and the chemical cluster in the south of the Netherlands. Um, and, and that, uh, at the moment, uh, the, the TSO is working on uh, converting some of that to, uh, to hydrogen. Um, so you have multiple generation production units as well as, as off-takers. Uh, and typically, you know, you're far away from each other. Um, and, and, you know, many countries in Europe are studying uh, backbones, including Netherlands, Germany, Spain, and France. And that's, you know, billions of dollars. And lastly, international trade. This is a picture, again, of the same same vessel uh, where, you know, you could either uh, transport liquid hydrogen, ammonia, or a liquid organic hydrogen carrier to customers thousands of kilometers away. And, and you know, I'm, I'm convinced that hydrogen, because of different cost points, you know, will be a globally traded commodity like LNG or, or oil right now. Uh, but these are, you know, heavy investments, uh, a liquefaction, a hydrogen uh, liquefaction, plant is expensive, these vessels are expensive, you have to deal with boil off, there is all kinds of issues, they're super insulated because minus 253 degrees is not, it's not easy, that's, that's a lot colder even than LNG, but, you know, this is, this is all engineering, and in the end, you know, it, it's a cost picture whether it can be done, and whether you can get agreement to make an investment. Um, and I think that's it. Um, um, through my presentation and, and happy to take any questions if you will. Thank you very much, Frank. Um, there are several questions in the chat. Um, a question to you, uh, can you see the questions in the chat or would you like Jochem uh, and or myself to read them out to you? Maybe you can do that so they can focus on answering them so that uh, I don't have to. Uh, no problem. Yeah. Okay, so the first question that I see is, um, one second, after all the thank yous, uh, which of course, thank you so much, uh, first of all, Frank, for your inspiring lecture. And um, the questions uh, of the audience are uh, going to come next, one sec. Okay, um, taking into account that LCOE of renewables is decreasing, does it make sense to produce blue hydrogen? A question from Leima Klemas. Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. So I, I, I think uh, there's recognition that, um, um, you know, in the end, eventually green hydrogen will be cheaper than, uh, than blue. Uh, but, but the fact is that at the moment, um, you know, we're not producing hydrogen at all. So all, all of this is PowerPoint, you know, we're making, you know, we're preparing for investment, but the reality is that we need gigawatts and gigawatts of solar and, and offshore wind, et cetera, to make hydrogen. And to build, um, uh, you know, infrastructure, for example, these gas pipes in the Netherlands, to fill that, and have to, you would have to probably wait, you know, five to ten years uh, before you would have enough green hydrogen to fill a hydrogen backbone. And in the meantime, you know, if you have, uh, let's say, grey hydrogen production, you capture the CO2 uh, and, and then produce blue, uh, we, we, we probably need that in the short term to get us going. Uh, but your question is a, is a valid one because over time, I think blue hydrogen, you have to make sure that uh, that, that you're not priced out of the market. Um, so your investment horizon, uh, you need to be very confident that uh, in the end you will not be overtaken by green, which which probably will happen uh, within the life, the technical life of your your investment. So that is a risk that uh, that any investor will need to take into account. But I think the reality is that policymakers also recognize that, that we probably need blue. Um, uh, in, in the beginning to get us going because we just don't have enough green. Thank you. There are two questions relating to the colors of the hydrogen. One is whether you could briefly explain again what blue hydrogen is and the other um, whether you could also relate to turquoise hydrogen with negligible CO2 emissions. Yeah, so I mean, there is a number of, of um, you know, methods to make hydrogen uh, and if you, so basically the standard way to do that now is the methane reforming of natural gas, a lot of CO2 emissions associated with that. If we capture the CO2 and store it, we call that blue. 
But the, the reality is that there are so many different grades of blue because there's different capture rates, different storage rates in the Middle East. They want to, you know, use the uh, the CO2 for announced oil recovery, so that you know leads to more CO2 emissions. So how to account for all of that is is work that is currently being undertaken. Uh, there is um, all kinds of um, institutions, uh, in including the International Partnership for the Hydrogen Economy and uh, the Hydrogen Council, IRENA, they're working on, uh, and, and the European Commission working on guarantees of origin, where you do this type of accounting, uh, where you basically do a life cycle analysis of, uh, you know, how many CO2 emissions are associated with a certain pathway. Uh, because in the end, uh, you know, it, it needs to be an effort that uh, that supports decarbonization, uh, and we cannot have, you know, let's say hydrogen, which is clean when you, when you use it in, in in a city in a in a vehicle, but it has a, a lot of associated CO2 emissions upstream. So that accounting needs to be done, and that's work in progress. Now, in terms of turquoise, um, uh, I mean, there's various ways of. Um, you know, technologies where you take natural gas and then uh, you produce hydrogen and carbon black. Uh, very, very interesting, uh, but but very low TRL. So technology readiness level uh, is lowish uh, in the sense that it hasn't been done at scale. But if if you um, if you crack that, it would be very, very interesting uh, to to still uh, you know further use. Um, uh, nat natural gas reserves that you have without the CO2 footprint, because carbon black, you can use it for many things. It's a, it's a pretty valuable commodity. Uh, you can, yeah, you can use it for many things and tires and, and you know, it's a soil enhancer and all kinds of things. Um, so that, that is certainly uh, an, an avenue that people are, are exploring. Thanks. I very much like the example that you gave uh, uh, when you had your own electrolyzers experiment as a child. I remember I also did this in my parents' home. Uh, and there is a question about the electrolyzers uh, of, of seawater, whether this will leave a lot of alkal uh, alkalinity in the sea. Maybe you can relate to that. Yeah, that's a good point because I mean, obviously, um, you know, hydrogen, uh, your green hydrogen needs water. Uh, although, I mean, there's also plenty of, of um, scientific evidence that um, uh, if we convert, uh, because you know, the power sector now uh, and and also uh, the energy sector in general uses a lot of water. So if we switch to you know a combination of green electricity and green hydrogen, uh, we will use much much less water than I think it's, it's less than half of, of the power consumption or the water consumption right now. The issue is that you know people are looking now at, at locations where there is not a lot of fresh water, like in the Middle East or in uh, you know the Atacama Desert or in Australia. Uh, so you you do need to look at at using seawater for that. Now the standard way is to um, uh, use reverse osmosis when you have electricity anyway. The cost point is not is not defining. You add about uh, one to two percent of the cost of hydrogen, or to the cost of hydrogen compared to if you have uh, fresh water available. So it's not it's not expensive. The issue is what to do with the brine because you uh, you have to use pure H2O and you end up with a whole bunch of um, you know magnesium and, and and potassium, all kinds of stuff that you don't want to put put back into. Uh, the sea because of uh, you know destruction of the marine ecosystem, uh, and there is some interesting work right now being done. For example, uh, in in um, in Saudi Arabia, Neom, where they also have a zero brine discharge policy uh, because you would uh, destroy the corals. And you know they're actually sea mining, so there's a, a number of interesting technologies. For example, you take the freezing, but they're looking at some other options where you take those minerals out of the brine uh, and actually monetize them. Um, you know magnesium. You know, it's very useful. You could actually use magnesium uh, to to make magnesium hydride hydrogen storage. And you know, the 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 the, the plants that Neom has in the northwestern corner of Saudi Arabia, uh, they, they would produce 10% of the global magnesium production from the from the reverse osmosis for the hydrogen production. So it's it's sizable amounts, uh, and and because of the value of that commodity, uh, it would probably pay for itself. But um, early days, uh, but but it's an important uh, you know you know piece of of R and D that we need to crack. Thanks. Um, we had on the 17th of June we had a Dutch Israeli mini symposia in which we introduced Israeli desalination technology, which could maybe uh, solve some of the issues you relate to uh, when we're talking about the quality of the water for the um, electrolyzers. There is a question from Shmuel Yerushalmi. He says that according to uh, your opinion, uh, Frank, the hydrogen can be changed in 100% a gas and oil in transportation systems. 
and to use as fuel for buses, trains, airplanes, and other transport tools. Uh, I hope that I um, read it out correctly, but um, and I didn't, then uh, tell me if I should try and understand it a little bit better. So let me interpret the question. Um, so yes, hydrogen can, you know, can basically be a base feedstock for all kinds of transport fuels. I mean, either, you know, right now you use compressed hydrogen, but you can also, uh, you know, use liquid hydrogen or even uh, super, super cooled hydrogen uh, at, at, at pressure uh, as a transport fuel. But you can also use ammonia as a transport fuel. You wouldn't use that in road transport, but as a, as a marine fuel, uh, hydrogen is, is used to make green ammonia that can be used as a marine fuel. And, and hydrogen, uh, green hydrogen can be a basic feedstock also uh, for all kinds of uh, aviation fuels. So that is already now being done. Uh, you know, based on, on, on waste to energy, including, you know, the, the green hydrogen component. But, but um, yeah, there's all kinds of solutions where hydrogen as a molecule uh, can, can be a feedstock uh, for all kinds of transport fuels uh, in, in addition to electricity. I mean, uh, you know, very often I, I, I sense that there is this like competition between electric mobility and fuel cell mobility. I think we'll probably need all of that uh, and uh, as, as quickly and as much as we can, uh, so rather work together than, uh, than than try to compete. Although, of course, uh, in the end, if if it's about vehicles, you know, a consumer just buys one. You know, you'll either buy an electric vehicle or a fuel cell vehicle. But in terms of fleet and going forward and heavy duty transport, I think there is a place for all of that. Thanks. And there is a question from Kabanga. If you could maybe elaborate a little bit more on the difference between green electrons and green molecules. Um, well, an electron is an electron. Uh, it has to flow all the time. So you can't, uh, I mean, that's the basic principle of electricity. It's, it's actually a flowing electron. That's why you can't store electricity. Uh, you can only convert it to something else. Uh, and, you know, when we store electricity, well, what we call storing electricity is actually converted to something else in a, you know, in a chemical battery, uh, you, you use electricity in a chemical process to get electricity back, but it's a conversion. If we pump up hydro, uh, then you convert that into, um, uh, you know, a gravitational energy. If we, um, you know, so electricity, that, that is, I think, one of the major differences uh, that electricity, if you want to store it, you always have to convert it, and there's losses uh, with that, but if but a, but a gas you can store a gas loss free over a season, uh, as we do right now. Um, so a green molecule you can store loss free, transported much more cheaply uh, than an electron. But in many cases, uh, electricity is, is easier to use. Uh, you don't have you know in in the use case if you need lighting or cooling or whatever. It, it, uh, electricity has has major advantages, it's also clean, etc. Uh, so they're just different and very, very complementary. That's why I really like this vision of 50% clean electricity and 50% clean hydrogen. Thank you. There is a question of Shelly Zalgari from uh, Gencel in Israel, and she asked whether you could clarify what you meant when you said that hydrogen will be $1 per kilo equivalent to $6 or $9 MMBTU, natural gas. Yeah, that's just the um, the you know the the value per calorific value. Uh, sorry, yeah, per, per calorific uh, unit. Um, so one one dollar um, per kilo of hydrogen roughly equates to uh, six dollars mmbtu in terms of of usefulness of of the molecule. So it does the same. Uh, and six six dollars per mmbtu. Um, no, sorry. So one dollar would be nine. Uh, so nine dollars per mmbtu is is, is already a, a price lower than what many Asian countries now pay for LNG. So that is um, uh, th that is something that that's already in the market. It's just a comparison. Thank you. We have time for five, let's say a few more questions because we have five more minutes and the questions are flowing in, but uh, we'll go through them as we go along. There's a question of Ami Maron from Israel. Would hydrogen be able to power electricity plants? Yes. Um, 
I mean, one of the um, one of the avenues that Japan is pursuing is well, it's not not so much hydrogen, but but you can. But uh, they're they're thinking about burning ammonia in power plants. Um, you know, the issue after the Fukushima uh, disaster is that they switched off all the nuclear power plants, and then you know they had to ramp up all the coal-fired power plants in Japan, which is of course a concern with regard to the carbon emissions. Uh, and one of the things that you can do with relatively minor investment is co-firing of ammonia in a pulverized coal power plant. Um, you know, up to 20% can be done with relatively uh, small investments. But you can even, in the end, uh, chuck out the entire coal chain, uh, and then uh, you you basically burn 100% ammonia. So that's possible. Then you keep the, the staff, you keep. Uh, you know, the electricity infrastructure, et cetera, et cetera. So a lot of the infrastructure, um, you know, remains the same. Obviously, instead of the big coal heap, you have ammonia tanks. Uh, but that, um, you know, the, there is, a, of course, NOx emissions, but that seems manageable. Uh, so that is definitely something that Japan is, is very uh, aggressively pursuing. Thank you. Um, you were mentioning that um, hydrogen is also going to be transported in pipelines. If you can say something about the percentage of hydrogen that can, can be mixed with natural gas in pipelines. Yeah, that's, um, uh, that's an interesting question. I mean, um, it, it seems, you know, for many, uh, you know, so for example, GFT de Gaz in France did, did a study and up to 6% uh, blending can be done relatively easy uh, in, in the sense that you don't need to change much. Uh, and then, you know, Cadence uh, and, and, and Northern Gas Networks in the UK, they've looked at up to 20% and they're looking at that in the distribution center, uh, system uh, now. Uh, so let's say roughly up to 20% you, you could blend. Uh, the question is, uh, you need to define that because you are changing the gas quality. First of all, hydrogen is more expensive than natural gas. You're increasing the price, but the calorific value is lower. So you're reducing the gas quality uh, at, at a higher price point. So that has to has to make economic sense, but you know there's all kinds of subsidy mechanisms or you know other regulatory regimes that make that make something like that work. Now, what you do have to um, uh, consider is that, um, that that you have to plan for a certain percentage, especially in the mid and you know the, the high pressure gas pipes and the medium pressure gas pipes. Uh, downstream, it's probably less critical because people, you know, just use it for gas, uh, you know, cooking and, and, and you know, house heating. Um, but, but uh, on, you know, more upstream, it becomes a little bit more complex. And also, what you have to realize, for example, certain, uh, you know, um, if you use compressed natural gas uh, for mobility, which is something that uh, is in many places in France the case, then you can only have 0.6% hydrogen. Uh, so if you would then go to your, you know, theoretical easy uh, threshold of 6%, you would already have a problem with CNG tanks uh, certification uh, for, for CNG vehicles. So there is uh, those kinds of things to consider, but 6% is relatively straightforward and, and up to 20% is, is easy. Thank you, Frank. Uh, there is a question about the safety of hydrogen uh, and how industry solves these safety issues. If you could elaborate on that. Yeah, that's, um, of course, always uh, an important question. And, um, you know, it is, of course, a gas that can explode like natural gas and other things and, uh, and, and, and diesel and, and, and petrol. So you have to you have to make sure that um, uh, that, that you cater for that. Now, fortunately, we, we had a lot of hydrogen uh, in the distribution system uh, because we had town gas in many places in Europe and in Hawaii and, and other places. Uh, which is coal seam gas. So you, you manufacture gas from a coal deposit and uh, then you pump it around in, in a city. And that was already 50 to 60% uh, hydrogen. Uh, so for example, in the Netherlands, we had, we had town gas, which was you know, majority hydrogen. And then we found natural gas in Koningen and then we switched to, to natural gas. Um, so, so we know uh, how to deal with it. Um, you know, obviously it's a much lighter gas. So you have to make sure that if it escapes, uh, you don't trap it. For example, if you look at hydrogen or fueling stations, you know the, the construction of the roof is always it has to open. It has to be able the hydrogen. If if there is a emission of hydrogen, it has to, it has to be able to to, to basically uh, escape. Because if you if you have like a, like like an umbrella type of capture area, that would be dangerous. So there are certain things like that. Also in in the way 
you know, uh, Kiwa did um, a, a safety study on the distribution system in the Netherlands. And, you know, you have to make sure that if you're digging up a, a street and, and, for example, you would, you know, you would hit a gas pipe, you know, if you would hit a, a hydrogen pipe, you know, under circumstances that would be more dangerous than a natural gas pipe. But, you know, so you have to make sure that, that you know what you're doing, but it's not something that we were not used to. Uh, handling and uh, you know it's just different so all, by and large i think hydrogen uh, is not more dangerous or less dangerous than natural gas which we've all accepted uh, everywhere in our lives and cities uh, but it's different and we have to make sure that that we we handle it properly and with your permission one more question also related a little bit to safety and pollution the question is uh, won't burning of ammonia result in nox pollution yeah, absolutely. So uh, that that is absolutely uh, so. I mean, the um, the paradox is that, for example, uh, in a in a coal-fired power plant, you already inject ammonia, even though that has uh, nitrogen in a denox unit. So you use ammonia, you basically use fire to fight the fire. Uh, so denox units uh, use ammonia, but 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 absolutely. I mean, uh, uh, of course, we cannot have uh, emissions of of NOx. Um, but but that's that's doable. Um, so all all of these things, whether it's in a marine uh, engine or in um, you know a, a, a power plant, you know when you burn ammonia, uh, you have to treat um, you know the flue gases and, and get the get get the denox or get get, get the, the the NOx out. Uh, and 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 that's engineering. It's a cost uh, question. Uh, but it's it's not something that cannot be done, uh, and and of course in in all the studies that you know now uh, Japan is doing or MAN is doing, they're all taking that into account because you know again you know it, it will you will have NOx and we have to reduce that to to a very very low level otherwise it wouldn't make any sense uh, because we're replacing CO2 with NOx which is also a greenhouse gas so it cannot be done. Yes. Frank, I really want to thank you very much. And uh, for the audience, um, you have uh, asked a lot of questions and uh, a large portion of which have not been uh, answered. Uh, we will uh, note all your questions and then we will see how we can address them later. For Frank, I think what is important, or maybe from our perspective of Jochem and myself, is that Frank has a, a very broad uh, view of the hydrogen um, economy as it's been developing in the last 30 years. And I think what's also very special about you, Frank, is that you're on one hand, you're also uh, originally from the Netherlands, but you have very good knowledge and foothold in the, in the Gulf countries. And that could be maybe something when we will talk a little bit more about Israel's uh, possibilities in the field of hydrogen and hydrogen valleys uh, in particular, that it could be taken into account. In addition, you also mentioned the MENA countries and Israel is also one of the countries which is part of the Middle East and North Africa. And therefore, I think that there will be more dialogue uh, between Israeli um, uh, organizations and, uh, and yourself. So with this, I really want to thank you. And um, we will uh, continue with our next speaker, who Jochen will introduce. Thank you, Frank. Thank you. Thank you, Frank. Indeed. And our next speaker is uh, Leon Still. Leon Still is also my manager. Um, he's the managing uh, business school of a new energy coalition, as I mentioned in the beginning, and Energy Delta Institute. Leon has a background in uh, earth sciences and renewable energy technology. He has a master in that uh, from the University of Utrecht. Uh, from the start of his career, he has focused on conventional and renewable energy technology development and has held commercial roles in several energy companies. Uh, furthermore, he worked for the Netherlands Organization for Applied Scientific Research, also known as TNO, as a business, business development manager dedicated to enabling and accelerating the energy transition. Lee speaks in some of our uh, energy transition programs, uh, for example, about green gas, and today also about hydrogen, and moderates our webinars. Um, I think, uh, Rachel, you mentioned some questions in the chat are not answered yet. Uh, we can also ask these questions to Leon, but without further ado, uh, Leon, the floor is yours. Good luck. Thank you very much, Jochem. Uh, I hope everybody can hear me yes. well and see me, so that's good. And it's always uh, an interesting experience to hear somebody else talking about you in uh, like, how yeah. good are you? <laughs> <laughs> but that's fine. 
Uh, let me just uh, share my screen. Then we can start. And indeed, if there, there are a lot of questions, that is actually good. So we can have a nice discussion, at least also at the end, uh, just because probably I can answer some of the questions as well. Um, yeah, like I said, uh, I will uh, today I will talk a little bit, I will go a little bit more into detail on the things that Frank already mentioned. So Frank did a very good job in introducing uh, uh, the whole hydrogen value chain and whole hydrogen economy in uh, a lot of information in one hour. So that's a good thing. I will go first a little bit more into production, transport, storage and economics, and then a little bit more in end uses and how I see that developing because for everybody, it's still in the beginning, of course, of the uh, whole value chain. Yeah, now yeah, you already introduced me, so I'll we'll skip this slide. Uh, you guys see my slides moving, right? Yeah, yes. Sometimes that's a problem. Um, maybe just to go a little bit back, like what are we doing all this for? Uh, obviously, the idea is to decarbonize our energy system and to do it as quickly and as cheaply as possible. Uh, so we don't want to uh, emit CO2 or carbon at some point, hopefully uh, earlier than later, uh, because we want to. Uh, uh, yeah, reduce the, the effect on the climate, but we also want to do it cheaply and we want to do it in such a way that is that fits the, the maybe the current system, but also the future system uh, or the future economy. Basically, if you talk about the European Union, but I think it's in general around the world, you've got two, two options or a combination of the two. So you either go to a high molecule situation, yeah, because that's something that we are used to at the moment, if you talk about hydrocarbons, and you're going to uh, decarbonize those high, those molecules, or you're going to go to a high electron, high electricity system, and then you're going to make that green, or you do a combination of the two. And then the key drivers for that, of course, are, like I said, the economy, how much does it cost, what are the benefits, the social part as well, how much acceptance is there for these kind of technologies and implementations, how disruptive is it, and also the technical part. So is it available or is the future technology in within reach? Uh, for the European Union, just to give a little bit of background again, Frank already mentioned it, um, about maybe 20 years ago or 10 years ago, it was really serious about, about decarbonizing the economic of the, the, the energy system of the European Union. Um, here, there are some figures on that. You know, if you see in, in, within Europe, about 50% uh, of the electricity that is currently produced is renewable, if you also count nuclear. Uh, that has cost in 10 years time about 1000 billion euros, which is a lot of money, sounds like a lot of money, it is a lot of money, but it's only a half percent of the EU economy. If I compare it with the amount of money that's apparently available to save our economy from Corona, uh, it's a, a small thing. So uh, apparently we have a, a, an, if there's a need, then we have the money for that. But of course, 80% of our total energy mix is still is made up of molecules, so fuels and gases, um, and we only decarbonize 4% of that. So there's still a long way to go. Uh, it brought us a lot of things, uh, like Frank also mentioned, the uh, cost of uh, renewables have gone down significantly. They're cheaper most of the time uh, compared to fossil fuels. So that's a good thing, but it, it took time, it took money to achieve that. And if you talk about hydrogen, we're still in the beginning of that cost curve, but we still have to do something about the molecules. And this is maybe for Europe, not everywhere is the same, um, but in generally speaking, 80 and 80 percent is molecules trend electricity. Uh, sorry. Now, hydrogen is a way to decarbonize the molecule part. Eh? Uh, you can do that with with hydrogen, especially if you talk about Europe or uh, places where there's lots of natural gas available. We are used to that kind of molecules. Uh, hydrogen is a different molecule, obviously. But it's also a molecule uh, that can be transported easily, etc. So there are different ways to do that, and hydrogen is one of them. Uh, so it has a large potential to decarbonize that uh, our our energy system. Uh, you can do that with a lot of different things. Uh, so, but in the end, you have to see: okay, how much does it uh, save you in terms of uh, of carbon emissions, but also how much does it cost? So I will talk about these two. If you look at the the the, the, the picture on the right side. Uh, there are some of these examples, it's quite small, but you can look at it later, uh, where you can see, okay, what are the CG emissions, so the greenhouse gas emissions uh, of all these different technologies, how much do we expect them to be in 2030 and 2050, if you talk about development of these technologies. Uh, so you have, for example, using coal and coal gasification with CCS, 
that will bring you about nine kilograms of CO2 emissions, uh, carbon emissions compared for one kilogram of hydrogen, which is still a lot. But if you then go down all the way to the, the bottom of the page, so wind and hydro and solar uh, compared to electrolysis, that uh, gives you a lot less um, CZ emissions. But So th those are the combinations we want in the end we want to go for. I think it's good to mention here that if you talk about hydrogen, I will come to all the colors. But the idea of this, of course, is to make it as green as possible. So we have to uh, get it from renewable energy sources, electricity sources, solar and wind. Uh, but in between, we can go for different routes. But in the end, that is the way we want to go, the end point. Um, so what are the calls of hydrogen? Uh, Frank briefly already mentioned them. Uh, I always get the feeling again, there are uh, more and more uh, people are thinking about more and more of them. Um, but you basically have two, uh, two input sources. You either have something, uh, some electricity production systems and you have fossil fuels uh, where you can go for. Uh, so you have a greenish part and you have a gray part uh, in different types of colors. So you have green hydrogen uh, with a technology called electrolysis with the separation of, of water into hydrogen. Uh, and then if it's green, it comes from wind, solar, hydro, geothermal, or tidal energy. Uh, they also have pink hydrogen, which comes from nuclear power, which uh, at least for direct CG emission is quite minimal as well. And they have yellow hydrogen, which is basically a mixed origin of that, uh, of those two, either nuclear or uh, uh, wind or solar hydro. And then the, for the fossil fuel parts, you have blue hydrogen, which is natural gas reforming, which Frank also mentioned. So your input is, is natural gas or maybe coal ga gas, and you add on that uh, carbon capture uh, system, which gives you also a relatively low footprint. And uh, then you have turquoise hydrogen, which is a pyrolysis system. Uh, pyrolysis means that you, you convert the natural gas uh, to carbon black, and you, the carbon black is a solid, so it's easy to dispose. And then you also have uh, uh, just pure hydrogen. The input from that is also natural gas, so you have solid carbon a byproduct. Uh, gray hydrogen is just natural gas reforming. That's what is used at the moment a lot uh, if you talk about refining and chemical plants. And uh, then you have brown hydrogen and black hydrogen, which is gasification from coal. Uh, all, so the last ones have a very high CHD emission footprint, which is not necessarily what you want. Uh, and then you go all the way from black hydrogen to green hydrogen and all, everything in between. Here's a little bit more detail. Like I said, your fossil fuels is one uh, of the inputs and the renewable source is the other. In the end, we want to go to renewable sources, but that's something that has not been done at scale at the moment. And that's where all the projects are for, to make sure that we are, have the development uh, of the technologies that are required uh, so we can get it more cheaply. And uh, so you can go from renewable sources, you have the water splitting part, but interestingly, you also have biomass part. So biomass part uh, is basically a thermal chemical uh, separation system. They can go to pyrolysis, gasification, combustion, liquefaction. Um, or you can go to a biological system, uh, which is fermentation or photolysis. And um, all these technologies are sort of in the development, especially if you talk about uh, the biological parts. So I mentioned them here in a, in a table, some of them. So steam reforming and partial oxidation. Uh, they're commercial, but they're from the fossil fuel part mostly. Uh, and then you have some other ones that are uh, near term or long term. Uh, biomass gasification is also commercially available, although it's not been done that much, uh, to be honest. And then if we talk about electrolysis, it's commercial, but it's not that much on scale yet. It still needs to grow. Uh, and uh, the other ones are all long term um, to do that. We, Frank mentioned it already also briefly about the efficiency, but I just have to say here that hydrogen is a source, is an energy source, it's not an energy, it's an energy carrier, it's not a source. And so we always need to input something else to make hydrogen. So hydrogen makes sense in a lot of things, in a lot of sectors it may make sense, it, it may solve some of the problems like transport, like storage, uh, and also in a economic sense it could also work, but we still need to have some kind of other um, energy input to make hydrogen. Uh, so in that sense, that's why I'm saying efficiency is important because the, the, the more, uh, the, the, if you are very efficient in converting some uh, electricity, for example, into hydrogen, then you know, don't need to implement a lot of the renewable energy sources that you need. Then it's better to, uh, the higher the efficiency, 
the better it is. Although in an economic sense, it may work differently, but from, an econo uh, from a sense in how much electricity production, how much wind parks, how much solar parks, etc., we need, the higher the efficiency, the better it is, also in terms of the whole system. Um, yeah, so that's basically in a nutshell how it is produced. There are a lot of these technologies that are still under, under, under production, uh, for under development. So for electrolysis, that is the, the main thing that, we're, that most of the, the attention is on, but also on blue hydrogen as an intermediate uh, going from uh, the system. We, we need to introduce hydrogen at some point into our system. It is not being used that much at the moment. So you, uh, blue hydrogen is a sense of, of already getting used to how to, uh, to producing hydrogen at scale at a lower, I will come to the cost in a little bit while, at a lower cost. And then you will see, then you can sort of kickstart the hydrogen economy and then wait a while until you have uh, green hydrogen available to put into the system. And one of the things that Frank also mentioned, of course, hydrogen is transport and storage. Uh, so to transport the storage part is a very important one. Hydrogen is a very flexible fuel. And so you, it can be stored um, infinitely, I would almost say, or at least for a very long time. Um, that is a, a, a huge advantage over, for example, electricity, although the development of batteries and the cost of batteries are also going very quickly. But it's, of course, not feasible on a very large scale to have this enormous amount of batteries. There, then it's uh, better to, uh, to store it in, for, in the form of hydrogen, for example. So you have physical-based storage and material-based storage. The physical-based storage is in a form where the hydrogen is still hydrogen. So it's either compressed gas, for example, so you compress it, you put it somewhere in a tank or uh, under the ground. Then you have cold or uh, cryo, uh, so you make it very cold and you then compress it again. And you have liquid hydrogen, which is a combination of two, very high pressure, but also very cold. And why do you do this? Because you want to make this um, hydrogen is a, as a, uh, the energy density of hydrogen is not very high. So the volumetric density in that sense is also not very high. So as a, as a, um, a gas, it is not ideal to store. So you need to sort of um, reform it. So you have a very high gametic density and a very high volumetric density, a low volumetric density. So you can put it somewhere in a, uh, in a cavern or something like that. So I just highlighted on the right that the liquid hydrogen or the hydrogen in a very high pressure has a very high gravimetric density. So a lot of energy per kilogram that you can put in uh, somewhere and that you can actually store and then use later on. And that's one of the main problems with, for example, renewable electricity. You, you may have a lot of it in summer, but you don't need a lot of it in summer. So then you, where do you going to store it? The other thing is the material based. Material based means that you are going to change it. So you change it in something else. And so we are an, an organic liquid, for example, or in ammonia or a chemical hydrogen. Uh, so you basically make it stable and li liquid or a solid. That's also possible uh, in, in the case of an adsorbent. Uh, and there you can do the same thing. You have a very high energy density with a low volume, and then you can use it later on, or you can put it in a truck or something like that which is more convenient than having it as a gas. Um, yeah, so the hydrogen transport also has, uh, like Frank also showed, uh, it is actually much more favorable to transport uh, gas or hydrogen compared to electricity. And so here there's some of these uh, um, yeah, costs for that. And so you need, like you said, it is about 10 times more efficient to do this uh, compared to, to a power line. Um, the, the story in that sense, I've, I'm just trying to put all these things together here. Uh, I don't think it is as black and white as this, to be honest. <clears throat> so we can make these power lines, but the gas lines as well, it's cheaper, yes, but you also have to maintain the gas lines. You have to do something about the gas lines. Uh, you cannot really reuse all the gas lines as they are at the moment. You do have to change them a little bit if you're going to blend hydrogen into it, or if you're going to use hydrogen directly into in these these pipelines, uh, but in the, in essence they are much cheaper uh, to lay. Um, but I also have my doubts related to how much is the lengthivity of these things. So a power line, I think, goes uh, further in time uh, before you have to replace it than a gas pipeline. But we'll just have to see. But in the end, overall, it is indeed cheaper 
to transport uh, energy through a gaseous form in a pipeline than it is to transport energy uh, in a power line in, in the form of electricity. And it is, of course, well, leak free. It's not entirely leak free. It can be leak free. Uh, and, but, and so there are always some losses. But like I said about the trend, the storage part, yeah, so you can also store a lot more energy in a salt cap, for example. Uh, we have this, at least where, depending on where you are, but in Northwest Europe, there are a lot of these kind of, and also in Ukraine and in uh, other places in Europe and in, in the United States, there are caverns available, salt caverns available, or other type of geological structures available where you can, can store gas that's already being used at the moment to store natural gas, for example, or nitrogen. Uh, they could also store hydrogen because these these caverns are basically um, yeah solid, so they're not, they don't leak. Uh, so you can store a lot of energy in the form of hydrogen inside these caverns. Uh, if you have to would have done that with a battery, in this case a power wall, you need an enormous amount of power walls to do that, which is of course not feasible, especially in terms of price, but also in terms of all the the, the materials that you actually require. Uh, and it's the new technology. And so you storing this this hydrogen in salt caverns is also new, but we know a lot about it, uh, about storing gases in salt caverns in general. And uh, so there's many years of experience in the UK and the US. So it's quite easy to, to, to sort of change that into hydrogen when it is available. There was already a store, uh, uh, questions about uh, the infrastructure reuse. Uh, that's one of the main advantages, I think, of, of hydrogen, especially if you have a region like your Northwestern Europe or Europe in general, but also the United States, where there's already a large uh, gas grid available. And so now we use natural gas, but we can, of course, use the same grid for hydrogen, although we have to change it a little bit. Here I sort of mentioned, Frank mentioned, okay, 6% is already without any problems possible. Uh, I put here the line at 20, uh, because there have been a lot of experiments or also on a somewhat larger scale saying, okay, you can just blend hydrogen up to 20% in the gas grid without any problems. Uh, if you look at here, for example, the pressure regulators, the meters, the storage tanks, uh, the valves, the transmission pipelines, and also some of the cogeneration plants, uh, they don't have any problems. They're not. Uh, you can just blend hydrogen there without any issue. Uh, for the home gas stoves and burners, depending on how, what they are and what kind of technology they are, they're using. You do have. Um, you do need to adapt that a little bit. And the same goes for gas turbines and compression stations. So it is for up to twenty percent. There's not a real problem, um, but there's some adjustment needed over that. Uh, and especially if you go to 70 or 80 or 100 percent, there's further research required for the pipes itself. It is not uh, a big thing, uh, though, at least in the beginning, when people were talking about doing this, they say, OK, there's going to be some leakage. Maybe there's some some um, transport of hydrogen molecules outside the pipelines, especially if you're standing still. Uh, a lot of experiments and safety experiments have been done on that. And there's not a big uh, that's not something that you expect. Uh, but you you can put in a liner, for example, in existing pipes to to already allow for that uh, yeah that way to go. Uh, so it is possible. So you can displace the fossil fuel with that. You can blend a little bit of hydrogen into that. Uh, it enables a reused existing infrastructure. There is adjustment re required, but not that much. Uh, and like I said, you can kickstart a hydrogen economy. Yeah? So if we're talking about how much hydrogen is currently in the system or how much hydrogen is being used, it is very low. If you want to go that route, we have to do it at scale. So why not kickstart the hydrogen economy by using the infrastructure that's already there and allowing industry, for example, to already use a lot of hydrogen uh, directly. There's also some, some cons to this whole system. Uh, there is minimal adjustment to some parts, but significant adjustment to other parts required, uh, like it says here in, in, the, in the picture as well. Um, hydrogen has a lower energy density. Uh, has a so the the actually the, the CO2 reduction that you are achieving by blending some hydrogen by displacing so a part of the fossil natural gas is not that high. So you are lowering the energy density, you're lowering the uh, uh, the amount of energy to transport through the pipeline. So that means that you, if you, in terms of reduction of CSG emissions, uh, it is less than you would expect in volumetric terms. Um, but still, it is something. Uh, and also the overall transport efficiency 
is that always depends a little bit on um, uh, yeah on your on where you are and how much does it cost but overall transport efficiency can be a little bit different and then uh, i think what frank also talked about is of course the regulatory challenge uh, so for a lot of these places natural gas pipelines are very regulated of course obviously because there are safety aspects to that um, so it's actually not allowed in a lot of countries still uh, also in our my own in the netherlands um, we talk about we have a lot of hydrogen projects we have a lot of hydrogen initiatives that are coming out but if you look at if it's actually allowed to transport hydrogen on the grid then it's not the case so we still need to change that as well we still need to make sure that all these regulatory uh, issues are uh, yeah being solved so that you can actually do all this and that's something that may seem as a bit of a yeah um a thing you just have to do as an afterthought almost but it is very important to do that as well uh, because otherwise you just cannot start maybe the economic part and yeah? uh, that's always the interesting question uh, so how much does it like i said at the beginning what are we aiming for here we're aiming for to do a full uh, system decarbonization or economy and energy decarbonization with new technology obviously but we all want to do it as quickly and as cheaply as possible um, frank in the beginning already showed a very nice picture about the learning curve if you talk about solar and wind yeah? but so over 40 years time the price of solar and the price of wind plummeted to the levels that we see now which is below fossil fuels if you talk about hydrogen we are not there yet at all especially you talk about green hydrogen which is in the end what we want to achieve and so it really depends on where you are on the planet if you can uh, may do it cheaply or what is the price but in general it is still very very high so before we are going down from whatever it is now which can be up to maybe eight or nine uh, dollars per kilogram of hydrogen which is enormous um, you have to go down to maybe one or zero or 0 0.6 or 0 0.8 uh, euros or dollars per kilogram of hydrogen so that that curve will take a long time still it can be quickly if we do a lot of projects it can it can be quite quick um, but maybe a decade or 20 years before you are there uh, is very is i think um, to be expected and if you see in this picture you have blue hydrogen and green hydrogen that they compare here in different places in the world so the green hydrogen, the one that we want to aim for, for example, in Denmark at the moment, costs about almost nine euros dollar per kilogram of hydrogen. If you go to the United States or to China or Qatar, it's a little bit cheaper or Chile, but it's still a lot of, uh, it's still much, much higher than natural gas. And it's also very far away from the electricity price that you have with renewables. If you talk about blue hydrogen, the, the, the story is a little bit different. Uh, uh, so blue hydrogen is already much cheaper because it's technology that we know obviously we have to put in the carbon capture part uh, and make sure that that goes well but still if you put that in you see that then then it is competitive already to maybe natural gas or at least a little bit more uh, and if you put some regulatory uh, systems on it then you can uh, some subsidies for example they can really stimulate um, hydrogen uh, blue hydrogen first and then go to green hydrogen in the development phase so all that is possible, um, but we're not there yet at all. Also, if you talk about hydrogen from electrolyzers, if you do about the CO2 intensity of hydrogen production in Europe, uh, so that one is still quite high. And uh, 2020, it will go down, 2030, 2050. So the expectation is that it will all go down. But if you look at it right now, you see that the renewable energy, uh, the cost of green hydrogen is, is still very high, and it's mostly related to the electrolyzer and to the renewable capex as well if you count that in an interesting thing about that of course is like frank mentioned as well saying okay renewable energy will go down more and more and more uh, so solar and wind will go down even further than it is down at the moment but i also think that there is a maximum or a minimum to that why would people implement uh, mm -hmm. wind parks and solar parks if they don't get any money for it by selling the electricity so there will always be some um, some pricing that needs to be there to make it uh, feasible for these parks to be built um, so it can be low but still it needs to be it can be it, it needs to be a certain level 
of that. So the green hydrogen price will go down significantly if we want to implement a lot of green hydrogen technologies, but I don't think it will go down all the way to below zero or something like that. That's not something we, uh, we can expect. <clears throat> Indeed, here the learning rates, and eh? that's also, um, uh, Frank showed one picture here, it's a more collective picture of that. Uh, so, it, in that sense, you see that how the more technology you implement, the, the cheaper it will get. Uh, but at the moment, we are really, really only on the left side of that picture. Uh, so, there's only a couple of megawatts or megawatt hours that have been implemented. And there's a lot of projects that are coming out, but also that Frank showed a nice overview of that. Uh, but you see that uh, you really need to implement and, and, and put in a lot of uh, megawatt hours and a lot of technologies before you are actually there. And, um, and I, I do have a little bit of doubt about that, whether or not we're going to make that. Uh, so there is a significant amount of, 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 of projects coming out, but it has a lot of um, comparison to, for example, carbon capture and storage. About 20 years ago, uh, a lot of attention was for that as well, for those technologies. Um, but in the end, it got overtaken by the price of solar and wind. And so it doesn't make sense anymore to put carbon capture systems on coal-fired power plants because it's just too expensive. And um, that's also why I'm seeing it here, and I will talk about it in the second part of my talk after the break, is that uh, for a certain industries and for certain sectors in the economy, I think it is very relevant to use hydrogen. But for a lot of things, I think it is uh, probably going to be a little bit too late. And so before we are having all this, this technology development and implementation in terms of green hydrogen, uh, it's going to take a while. And like I said, it is an anti carrier. So you also need to implement, uh, you also need to build all these wind parks and solar parks, or maybe not in Europe, but maybe somewhere else, and they have more expensive transport systems. So the system is much more complicated and then using uh, uh, electricity directly. But it is it makes sense for certain industries, for example, where they're using a lot of molecules at the moment. And it also makes sense to certain parts in the world. Uh, if you talk about this kind of technology development, it's possible in Europe and the United States, but it's also feasible in Europe and the United States because we have a natural gas infrastructure already there. So in that sense, it is more easy for us to switch for, for hydrogen. But if you're talking about different places in the world, maybe Africa um, they, or India, they are leapfrogging that system. So they're saying, okay, maybe we, uh, for us, we don't need to build a whole grid. We don't need to build a natural gas grid. Same with um, mobile phones. We're going to go directly to that technology, uh, which is probably going to be solar and wind a lot with some, some storage systems, some seasonal storage systems uh, and not going to go first to natural gas and then using hydrogen, et cetera. So yeah, I think it has a lot of, of potential because we need to do a lot of these things. But if you look at this cost curve as well, and it is implementation of all the technologies, it's a significant challenge to actually do this on time and to make sure that the technologies are cheap enough to implement. So I'm always a bit quicker than everybody expects. So I hope there are going to be a lot of questions uh, because this was my final slide. Oh, almost my final slide. Here's a summary of the, the hydrogen economy that I got from Bloomberg as well. Uh, and that also you see, okay, it requires a lot of, of, of uh, money, a lot of incentives and technologies to, to actually scale up hydrogen. So they are talking about 150 billion to get it to, to a competitive level in 2050. Um, so yeah, it has still has a long way to go. Uh, from the high price, eight, nine euros per kilogram of green hydrogen, maybe two or three euros per kilogram of blue hydrogen to go all the way to one, down to one kilogram or one euro per kilogram of hydrogen, which is competitive to all the other technologies that we want. That's it. Let's go to the questions. Yes, thank you, Leon, for the first part. Before we move to the break, indeed, there are some questions. There are some questions left from uh, the previous presentation by Frank. Mm -hmm them later as well. Uh, let's start with the basis. You discussed uh, blue hydrogen. Someone's asking, and it has been explained briefly in the chat, but uh, what is CCS? Okay, CCS, carbon capture and storage. Um, so basically what you do is uh, if you have a point source that, that, that emits carbon, that emits CO2, for example, then you can capture the CO2 
and then you and you transport it and you store it somewhere in a geological uh, um, formation, or you you change it to something else. Um, then you can uh, uh, yeah then you can you can decarbonize the the fossil fuel system that you are targeting. In the case of blue hydrogen, you have methane steam reforming. Um, so you 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 separate uh, the CH four into CO two and hydrogen. You capture the CO two and then you put it somewhere where out of harm's way that is not in the, in the environment. Thank you. And uh, pyrolysis. What is the efficiency of pyrolysis? Um, the efficiency in terms of of converting it is quite high. So in terms of of you know getting uh, from from CH four to to hydrogen is 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 relatively high. Um, the thing about pyrolysis is that you get about, uh, you get, for one kilogram of hydrogen, you get three kilograms of carbon black. Uh, and as mentioned, carbon black is, is a resource. It's something that is already being used at the moment for different applications, but it's not a very big market. So if we're talking about how much carbon black is produced from hydrogen, if we need tons and millions, billions of tons of hydrogen, then we're also going to produce billions of tons of carbon black if we're going to use the technology. And then we'll end up with an enormous amount of carbon black that we need to do something with. Uh, you swamp the market. Uh, so uh, it, that is, I think, the, the main drawback of that. But the efficiency is very high. And it's a stable compound that you have. So it's easier to sort of get rid of carbon black than it is from CO2, from a gaseous or liquid CO2. Okay, but uh, Frank previously mentioned that carbon black is a valuable uh, commodity. Yeah. But with huge uh, amounts of this carbon black, you, you do not agree that it's, it remains a valuable uh, commodity? Uh, yeah, I, I, that is something that, for example, CO2 is actually also a valuable commodity. So CO2, there are places in the world where CO2 is very, is, is very expensive. So if you talk about, for example, the Philippines, and you have a factory that uses, produces uh, sodas, like Coca-Cola or something, they can pay up to $800, $900 uh, per ton of CO2, which is enormous. But in general, CO2 is not a valuable, valuable product. And if you're going to make millions of tons of that, they have it available in that market space, then the price goes down enormously. And the same goes for the carbon, carbon black, especially because carbon black is relatively easy to transport. CO2 is not so easy to transport over long distances. So I uh, think it will swamp the market, at least the market as it is now. Perhaps other industries will, 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 will use it and then you'll have a higher price again. Uh, but I think that's the main drawback. Now it's very expensive or now it has some value, but if a lot of it is available, then the price will go down. Yes, yeah, thank you. Uh, people are asking about uh, presentations, about the slides. This will be shared with you later, maybe tonight, but at least before the end of the yeah. summer school. Yes, definitely. These slides. Uh, Laima Klemas asks uh, about this, the storage of hydrogen. So many different ways to store hydrogen. Which one has currently the best costs? The lowest one, how will hydrogen be stored in the future? <laughs> um, the lowest cost at the moment, I think, is just to uh, store it in sort of the salt caverns. Uh, so that's, that is absolutely the lowest way of uh, the lowest cost of doing it now. It's not something that has been done at scale yet. So we, we still need to figure out what are the drawbacks or the, the, the positives of that. But in the end, I think storing it, because then you don't have to transfer, then you don't have to change the molecule. Uh, you basically just compress it and inject it in uh, in the salt cavern, and that's it. So the costs of that are quite low uh, to do that. Uh, in the future, I probably, I personally think that if we're talking about large scale storage and transport, because we're probably going to transport a lot of hydrogen around the world, because in Europe, where we may need it, or in Japan, there's not that much space or uh, feasible renewable energy available, so to say, so we could get it from Qatar or from, from Morocco or whatever, then we need to transport it. And then I think the transport is probably much easier to change it into a stable molecule like ammonia, for example. Uh, although that costs energy, but in the end, I think in the economy, in the economic way of doing it, uh, that makes sense. Okay. How about changing the business case of photolysis to carbon capturing? Carbon capturing, then hydrogen production, you see. Maybe I we need some more information on that one. <laughs> yeah, Manisha, can you please um, uh, rephrase your question in the chat and then um, I will ask this question later to, to Leon. 
Another question about OPEX, uh, Leon. What is the difference mm -hmm. OPEX between liquids and gas hydrogen over time? On OPEX side? Yeah. Um, the, well, gas, you know, if you're making hydrogen, then you're, you, you get it in gaseous form. Uh, so if you want to make it liquid, and then you need to all, you add cost to that. So then it is either try, you know um, putting it in compressor stations or li liquefying it by by cooling it down. Yeah. So all these technologies cost a lot of money to do that, especially the cryogenic part. Uh, but it is easier to transport because you have a very high energy density and a very low volume. So OPEX wise, uh, the difference is enormous. Uh, yeah. 10, 20, 30 times as much. Yes, because you have to cool it down tremendously, right? Yeah, yeah. Minus 200 and something, 225 yeah. or something. <clears throat> okay. Uh, Shelly um, asks, hello, Leon. Why do we talk about reusing gas pipelines for hydrogen when the maximum capacity of hydrogen is just 20%? This doesn't really achieve our decarbonization targets. Are we kidding ourselves? <laughs> term intention for very transporting and exporting it's in line with your previous answer but yeah uh, the thing is that, that if you're repurposing uh, gas pipelines then we're talking about an end point where all the gas pipeline there's no natural gas in the pipeline there's only hydrogen in the pipeline uh, because and then preferably green hydrogen mm -hmm. but if you want to start that system then you cannot go from zero to 100 in one go this this is a transition so in that sense it would be best to already start that off by allowing some of the hydrogen in the system uh, maybe up to 20 percent without any problems uh, so that the we can test and we can see uh, if all the the equipment that is connected to it and if everybody is is sort of it can be done safely uh, so you you get used to hydrogen on the grid then after the 20 percent, of course you need to adjust the system more and more and you need to select which type of pipelines, the high pressure pipeline, for example, first, or maybe some dedicated pipelines towards industries that you repurpose for 100% of hydrogen. Uh, so you may not only do that for environmental purposes or for purposes of economy, but you do it to get people to get used to hydrogen on the grid, like a hybrid car in comparison to an electric car. Uh, so that was also basically for people to get used to electric mobility. Yeah, so we're not kidding ourselves. It's a, it's a we have to transition this period and uh, yeah. as soon as we have enough green hydrogen, we can use these pipelines for full yeah. capacity. In the meantime, we, you, we add mix this hydrogen with natural gas. Yeah, that's a possibility, yes. <clears throat> okay. When using zelt salt caverns, what about pollutants present in the space or walls of these caverns? Mm, now, there are... It... I don't think that is going to be a big problem. Uh, they, they, they have already been used at the moment for, for all kinds of uh, uh, stories, for example, of, uh, of methane. Uh, in that sense, if you, uh, produce, if you want to inject hydrogen in that salt cavern and you want to get it out again, you don't want to have it polluted with, with, with uh, methane, for example. There will always be some methane left. Uh, but you can also purge the system with, with nitrogen. So you do a first purge and you make sure that a lot of these, these um, uh, contaminants are out of the, the cavern and then you can uh, start again with uh, with hydrogen um, but you could you probably always require some kind of, of of polishing or cleaning system to make sure you have 100 um, percent but in sense of, of salt cavern specifically the the nice thing about the salt cavern is that it doesn't react to the gases that you put in so it doesn't react with hydrogen it doesn't react with um uh with with, with natural gas Thank you. Okay, let me see. Almost most of the questions are answered. If one of your questions has not been answered, if I skipped a question accidentally, please um, put it in the chat again. Do separate the hydrogen from the natural gas after it's flowing. Okay, yes, that question has been answered by you. Mm -hmm. Amir Sarit asking, can you relate to the to SOFC and MCFC fuel cell on technology on megawatt scale and their re uh, relevancy, price technology and CO2 emission to supply centralized electricity part of microgrid system? <laughs> oh, that's going to be a very complicated and very in-depth question. 
maybe I can save that one for uh, some email uh, contact with uh, yes. this person. I think that's probably better. I will send it to you and you can um, email. Yeah. Yes. Okay, then um, this was all over the news past weeks and uh, will be in the coming years, of course, uh, the, the climate change and report of the IPCC. Mm -hmm. In fact, the recent reports by IPCC indicating that we have actually far less time to prevent global warming to practically change the pace or methods by which the economy is developed. Was that the question? <laughs> yeah, sorry. <laughs> I, I will rephrase, uh, re, uh, repeat it. Uh, yeah. Do you expect a recent report by the IPCC indicating that we have actually far less time to prevent global warming to practically change the pace or methods by which the economy is the economy economy changing? Yeah. 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 yeah okay. um, that is, I started off by saying, okay, we need to do this in a certain time frame. And so now we set our time frame at 2050 for most of, uh, of the developed world and hopefully also the, 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 the world in development uh, to help that as well. Maybe we can be a bit more quicker if we want to, 2040 or something, but then we have to decarbonize our system. Indeed, because of the IPCC report says, okay, the climate effects are much more noticeable and severe than we expected, so we need to act quicker. Um, if you talk, if you relate it to hydrogen, that means you either have to do more because we still are not there yet. Eh? So, like I said, 80% of our system is still molecules and 20% is electrons. And uh, so we need to pick up the pace and do all, basically all the technology that are available to put them on scale. But we also need to be smart. So for some of the technologies that have already been had a significant investment and, and time to develop, we just need to do more of them: solar, wind geothermal, things like that. And then on top of that, there are a lot of, and I will talk about it after the break a little bit more, there are some hard to abate sectors, some sectors that are quite difficult to decarbonize, for example, heavy industry. So there, um, the cost of decarbonization is very high. So then you can have a hydrogen on top of that to help them decarbonize. But we need to do it much more quicker than what everybody expect. So you either are going to invest more and more and much more quicker in hydrogen technology that are not there yet at scale, or you're going to allow the other technologies to um, that are already there yet to change the system. As for example, I live in Sweden, uh, not in the Netherlands. I'm from the Netherlands, but I live in Sweden. And in the Netherlands, we chose at some point a natural gas grid because we have a natural gas, uh, a Groningen with a natural gas uh, source. But in the country I live in now, they didn't have any natural gas or, uh, sources available. So everything is on electricity. That is fine. That works. That works fine. But of course, they have lots more space here as well. They also have a challenge transporting hydropower from the north of the country to the south of the country where most people live. But still, you can do that too. So you can change the system in such a way that, for example, everything can run on electricity, but probably not for, for the industry, etc. And for the heavy transport. There, we need to be quicker. Thank you. Last question before we go into the break. And then we uh, answer the other questions uh, later on. Yeah, maybe a good discussion at the end of the day, always good. Yeah. yeah, indeed, there's also a discussion at the end of the day and there were also some questions can be asked, you're right. Um, how much is electricity consumption of green hydrogen? Ooh, how much is that? Um, that I still, yeah, I also have to look up, I'm sorry, that I don't have that, I don't want to give you the wrong answer. Um, you can also come back to it uh, after the break, Leon. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I will go back to it after the break. And I want to ask one other last question. <laughs> the Clean Hydrogen Mission was published on behalf of governments, stated that reducing end-to-end -end costs to a tipping point of $2 per kilogram by 2030. According mm -hmm. to the is this reachable? It is reachable if you're going to scale up quick enough. Yeah, indeed. So that is basically the only, only answer. So if you see about how much projects are being uh, implemented or at least are being announced at the moment, uh, then we can probably make it if we do all of them. But like I said, it, uh, 20 years ago, 10 years ago with the carbon capture and storage, this amount of projects were also announced. But in the end, you got overtaken by some things, realities, policies, public acceptance, things like that, to, to not doing it. So we implemented only a couple of these, these uh, technologies on scale. Now it, it is back because of the blue hydrogen and also because of industry. Uh, so we have an advantage there, but uh, it is doable if we're going to implement most of these projects. 
then then we can achieve it. Okay, we must scale up. Thank you. Uh, we um, start again at eight uh, eleven thirty Dutch time, twelve thirty Israeli time sharp, um, and we have a short break now for fifty minutes. Thank you. Yeah. No. Okay.
Okay, welcome back, everyone. Leon, first of all, thank you for the answer, but not only to Leon, also to other participants uh, for answering the questions uh, in the yep. chat. Um, we see uh, around 50 kilowatt hour electricity for one kilo of hydrogen. And uh, Leon, you confirmed I saw. Um, that was it about uh, production, storage, and transport of hydrogen. We're now going to move to the last part of this value chain. The end users, uh, as I said, are actually three main end users, the industry, mobility, and also the built environment. And that is where Leon is going to talk about for the, la for the coming uh, 45 minutes. Uh, Leon, the floor is yours again. Yeah, okay, thank you. I'll share my slides again. Now you already know me now, huh? after 45 <laughs> minutes, so that's good. <laughs> Uh, yeah, it will, let me just start off a little bit with the hydrogen value chain. Eh? So this is a picture that we had from uh, from Hydrogen Europe. Uh, so here, indeed, don't really, I will go into detail a little bit more, but basically you, you have the production, the transport, the storage, the distribution, conversion, and some kind of end use. And all of that requires different technologies, but also a different development in time. Uh, maybe what's interesting to see is that at the moment, uh, about 70 tons of hydrogen is produced annually. Uh, that's only for refineries and, and chemical production. I will give a little bit more detail about that. Uh, and most of it is from, uh, from fossil fuels. Um, so here, if you see what is it being used for at the moment, eh? so you have a chemical uh, refining iron and steel and also some other general industries that use it. So most of it is chemical and refining. Uh, like I said, 4% is from electrolysis now, which is not a huge amount. Uh, and they'll grow a little bit, hopefully, over time. But at the moment, that's most of the hydrogen demand uh, and production is going to these kind of industries. So in that sense, it's also easy for those industries to switch because now they produce it from natural gas by steam, machinery forming mostly, or from coal. Uh, so they could go to green hydrogen or blue hydrogen uh, as an intermediate uh, quite quickly. Um, a little bit more in detail again is also how much energy that basically costs. Uh, here. So here you see the demand for pure hydrogen is in for the refining in ammonia about me 38 megatons. And then for transport only a little bit. And then you have some hydrogen mixed uh, for methanol production, but also from some heat. Uh, and then usually those are already produced by byproducts. So for example, refinery byproducts or, or other uh, industries already have byproducts, also hydrogen as a byproduct or a mix. <clears throat> and they, they already use it for different uh, other production systems. But it's still quite small. But it is also, uh, yeah, it could be uh, an opportunity to start at least there and uh, make sure that uh, these, these industries will switch for, from the current gray or black hydrogen to uh, blue and green hydrogen. Yeah, coal gasification, so steam methane reforming here, and then here's some chlorine production, for example, where you also have some hydrogen production as a byproduct almost. And then 1% is green, which of course we need to make better. So hydrogen use. Now, I think for most people perhaps, but hydrogen uh, is a very versatile molecule. Yeah, so if you talk about where you can use it or what you can use it for, that's a lot of applications. And so it's indeed has a very nice um, integration potential in the current uh, in the current economy, in the current energy system as well. Uh, but for power generation can be used, hydrogen storage, vehicles, fuels. Uh, you can upgrade oils and biomass, for example, if you're SMC2. Uh, you can produce all kinds of fertilizers, metals, refining, it can be used. Uh, other chemicals as well, heating. Uh, so basically whatever we are using energy for now, we can also, at least for some parts, use hydrogen to do that. Uh, and we can integrate it into our current system. So this picture is from the United States, where of course they would like to introduce it also in their power grid, <coughs> current power grid, but then you can integrate it with whatever is already on the grid. Yeah, so you don't need to um, smarten the grid that much if you want to go, for example, for to full electricity. And so that's something also that Frank mentioned uh, if you talk about 20th century thinking, you have this base load thinking, saying, okay, you have a couple of big uh, producers that produce electricity or energy all the time. And then on top of that, you have some flexibility. 
uh, if you talk about renewable and electricity production, then you uh, basically reverse that thinking and you say, okay, it, it switches all the time. So my grid needs to be very smart to handle that. There needs to be storage systems, but there also needs to be a lot of intelligence uh, so that you can, for example, uh, charge your electric car when the electricity price is very low or negative. And then you can use some of that electricity in your car if it is very high price or if there's a lot of demand. That is something that is currently not possible with the grid, especially in developed countries. If you talk about developing countries, of course, you can redesign the grid yourself and there is maybe possible, but at the moment that's not the case. So hydrogen in that sense can take that place from, from, from flexibility and integration potential, but not for everything. Here, there are a lot of things mentioned, um, but of course there are um, sectors and opportunities where it is more relevant or valid for hydrogen to be implemented than others. And I will talk about that uh, a little bit more. So indeed, I think this picture, of course, has been, is, a lot, is known to a lot of people. But if you talk about where is it is most promising to do it, and then most promising in the sense of maybe technologies, but also or mostly in the sense of ease of use and uh, economic uh, measures, then it is in transport, but then most for me, my point of view, mostly heavy transport. It is in the industry, uh, build environment and some power, and also as a renewable feedstock for chemicals. I think those are the, the, the sectors, and especially industry, heat and power and, and the, the, the feedstocks. Those are the ones where it is very difficult to decarbonize if you look at the systems that they are currently using. And of course, the other one is acting as a buffer to make sure that the system is that there can be some storage, there can be some flexibility. Uh, but that flexibility is more relevant, I think, if you already have such, such systems like natural gas grids or salt caverns or production systems available. But it, it adds you some flexibility to the system and it is very valid for some uh, industrial and uh, built environment and some transport systems that are very hard to decarbonize. This picture basically sort of explains that a little bit. Let me explain it, what, what I mean here. If you talk about industry and about hard to abate sectors like ammonia production, ethylene, steel, cement, then the cost of changing the system that they are using now, changing technologies that they are using now, is very high. And so you could say on the le left-hand side, you see this picture. They're saying, okay, we have some, the cost of, for example, solar PV or onshore wind and things like that is quite low. But then, so you have electricity available that has a, a, a low cost. But if you are looking at this in a different way, then you're saying, okay, um, I can only, uh, I, I have my input is cheap, but changing my, for example, steel production system to electricity is very expensive. So then the cost of decarbonizing is very high. So then I need to use different technologies that with, with different uh, input systems. And then the lower half of the graph is basically these other technologies. So then there's also hydrogen gas, there is carbon capture storage, there's renewable natural gas, pumped hydro, things that have a very high cost if you talk about carbon abatement. But in, this, in the whole system, it makes sense for these uh, large producers to keep on using the technology that they have now to, to, for the most part, and then let them run on something else. Let them run, for example, on hydrogen or, or put a carbon capture storage system there. And so for current electricity prices, hydrogen as a fuel or feedstock here is not feasible yet. But if you say, okay, this, these prices and these technologies will go down, oh, somebody, sorry, will go down uh, a little bit, then we can use it more and more and more. <clears throat> and uh, then also you see that the amount of, of CO2 that we can, can decarbonize with, that we can reduce, is then much higher for those technologies as well, and also for those sectors. And so although the, the technologies that we can use, hydrogen, but also other technologies are much more expensive per metric ton of CO2 uh, reduced, for these industries, it is actually a little bit cheaper to use them. Um, transport, I think, is a bit of a, a different story, to be honest. Uh, so I think Frank already uh, you know, explained and touched upon a little bit if you talk about the efficiency and, and the sort of the battle between 
electric cars and cars that are run on hydrogen or uh, fuel cells. And I think personally, I think efficiency is important here, but it's not only efficiency, it's also the, um, uh, yeah, how do you say that? The, 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 the overall ease of use and also how much time is there for development. So on the right side, you see the cars, the battery electric is most efficient by far, but that although in an economic sense, it may be not that most efficient, it may be that, that, that hydrogen is more efficient in overall, if you talk about pricing, for example, but in the end, like I said, we want to have green hydrogen. We need 100% renewable electricity. So if we have a very low uh, overall efficiency going towards hydrogen fuel cells for cars, for example, then we require much more uh, renewable electricity generation to make that happen. So it is important that your efficiency is as high as possible. So for consumer electric cars, I think it will not happen that we will have a significant breakthrough of hydrogen uh, fuel cell cars. I think it will most likely be electric cars because they are just much cheaper already. They're becoming cheaper all the time. Also the range becomes higher and there are hundreds and thousands of, at least in the development world, electric charging poles. Um, and I don't think you can overtake that with a lot of hydrogen fuel stations as easy as that. But for heavy transport, it's a little bit different. For heavy transport, I think it's uh, it indeed makes sense to use hydrogen because these um, trucks and planes as well, but especially trucks and boats, uh, inland shipping, for example, uh, they require a, a much more higher energy density uh, than a battery can give you at the moment. So then there, it makes sense to have a fuel cell technology or to have ammonia, for example, uh, to burn ammonia instead of diesel uh, as, as hydrogen fuel uh, to, uh, to really yeah, decarbonize those sectors. I think that makes a lot of sense to do that. Uh, although also there, you see that electric cars and electric trucks, for example, are really uh, pushing there as well, even electric flying. Um, so it, uh, it's again a matter of how quickly can you scale up your technologies? How quickly can you reduce the price and make it available for a lot of people? Uh, on the left side, you see this thing this about the incentives. So the number of countries and how much incentives and where they have these incentives. Uh, it's, you, you, what I'm saying is not really reflected in the policies, I have to be honest, because most countries do indeed want to incentivize passenger cars and vehicle refueling stations, but the vehicle refueling station, of course, you can also use for heavy transport. So for buses and trucks and electrolyzer technologies, those are really being stimulated, but also some passenger cars, depending on where you are. Personally, because of the efficiency and the technology development, I think it will not happen for consumers, but we'll see. One of the nice things about hydrogen in that sense is the sector coupling. Yeah? So you can use all these different sectors to, um, you can interchange the technologies and then the, the, the energy between the sectors. So that's actually quite nice. That's something that's very hard to do with electricity. Uh, you couple all these different sectors because if you don't need it in one sector, you can use it somewhere else. There's always a, a buffer available uh, of a single thing, which in this case, green hydrogen. And then you can utilize it for transport, industrial use, or building and heat and power and feedstock when you require it. You could even add to that saying, okay, normally I would use, for example, for consumer transport, I would use electricity only if the price is right, I would do that. If the price is not right, then I will uh, use hydrogen that I have stored somewhere. And when there is an abundant amount of electricity available because the sun is shining all the time, then you can make more hydrogen as a buffer and then use it for industrial use or building heat and power, whatever you feel is required at the moment. So you really, can use the intermittency and the surplus uh, supply of electricity uh, to be converted to hydrogen as a storage, as a flexible flexible buffer. Uh, so you can you keep on running all these different sectors uh, in a good way. In that sense, the potential there is, is, well, it depends a little bit on who you ask, of course, how, how much potential is there for all these different sectors to really use hydrogen. But uh, it, it, I think that most people agree it is high especially for the industry and for power and some transport here's a scenario from uh from uh the gas for climate where they sort of calculated and say okay if we're going to change the energy system of the european union we probably go to 50 percent electricity which is already much higher than we have now uh, today renewable electricity and then we have some hard to obey sectors and some sectors that we 
feel is quite difficult to do. Then we go to renewable methane and uh, hydrogen. So renewable methane is different than hydrogen. Renewable methane is from, for example, biogas or gas from gasification of biomass, where you can directly where you use methane. So th that sense you're making natural gas standard methane that you can already put in the gas grid. But that technology has been around for 20, 30 years and the price is still relatively high. Hydrogen has a different, uh, it's the same niche almost, but a different technologies um, way of, of producing it. But here they say, okay, if we're going to do this and have 50% electricity, then we save 217 billion euros per year uh, because we can use the existing gas grid. We can use a lot of the existing industry can keep on using their existing technologies for the most part, but only some minor adjustments uh, and for transport as well. Uh, it is actually the most cheapest per carbon uh, abated, uh, per ton of carbon abated. Uh, so there you have a different, uh, yeah, this, this could be a scenario to work out. I have to say that they also saw a different scenario where they say, okay, let's get rid of all the gas grid. Then we don't have to invest in the gas grid. We only have to invest in, in cables and electricity production and in electricity storage or flexibility. Then they say, we're also going to save some 100 billion a year. So it's quite interesting that we uh, that all these sectors and all these um, calculations are sort of going one way or the other, depending on what you take. Yeah, most for the most part, Frank already showed this picture as well. Um, but I think here it's interesting to see that at least the, here you can see, okay, what is the, the value chain? What do we think will happen in 2015? So we have a business as usual and we have an ambitious scenario here. And there you see also the challenge. And so you see that, okay, now we have very little hydrogen, maybe 2% of the total energy supply. Uh, but we think that if we are going to do our best a little bit in 2030, then we'll get a lot more and maybe 6%. And then if we really try hard in 2050, we'll get about 25%. This is for the European Union. Uh, and then you see mostly in transport, but industry and heating and power. Uh, there will be uh, significant. But this, of course, is an enormous challenge to do. Um, so it's probably going to be somewhere in between, although the amount of attention that has been given for hydrogen at the moment is very large. So we'll see if that goes, goes well. But for transport, heating and power and industry, it is a good way to do it. Um, it's probably, that's what I forgot to mention, that it's probably also a good way to not scare your industry away. And so that's something also, we're, we're talking about climate change, we're talking about mitigating climate change, we're talking about decarbonization, uh, but there's also some real world economics going on. And there, if you have large industrial clusters, if you have factories and things like that, you don't necessarily want them to go away from Europe, for example, and go to China or to a different country where the rules are less strict because that doesn't matter for the, for the climate. Uh, and also we want to keep some of the, uh, the, the, the jobs and things like that here in, in, in Europe. Uh, so there it is also makes sense to help these kind of thing, these industries a little bit with hydrogen, although it may not be the best way, the most efficient way to doing it, but it is economically speaking, probably the most efficient way for a lot of these large industrial systems to do it. Yeah. Touch briefly on that, of course, already is the, the Green Deal. So hydrogen, uh, I think that the, the European Union sort of realizes that this is the case. And so that we have, uh, of course, a lot of attention is on electricity, is on green electrons, which is the logical about building up this, this industry over the past decades or so. Uh, but on the other hand, they also recognize that it is quite hard for the industry and for all these other sectors to decarbonize for a good price, for, for not a too high price. And I think in the Green Deal, but also in the Fit for 55, that is recognized that the difficulty is there. And so if the European Union is indeed going to promote a lot of these technologies and a lot of these hydrogen technologies, then I, I think it will be a significant push within the hydrogen value chain, within the hydrogen technology. And that, that push will post mostly take place in heavy transport in industry uh, and in the built environment. But for the built environment, it also depends on where you are. So if you're talking about built environment, for example, in the Netherlands, where already everybody is connected to a natural gas grid, it makes a lot of sense. If you talk about 
building something new or a country that already has a lot of heating on electricity, it makes less sense to go to hydrogen uh, or maybe on a hydrogen in a different way with sector coupling. Um, but for the Green Deal, I think it is a significant um, part in that is hydrogen for the industry. So here again, a little bit the scale up that people are expecting uh, to go for 40 gigawatt electrolysis. Uh, they want to even double that uh, 10 million tons of hydrogen, which uh, Frank already noticed is not the same as 40 gigawatt electrolysis. So we're going, probably going to import it, or at least the intention is to import it as well. So to make it a global value chain of hydrogen, which is not, can make sense. And producing it in places where there's a lot of sunshine, maybe even Israel or the regions around that uh, area and then transporting it and selling it to places where there's not so much renewable energy available like Japan or, uh, or parts of Europe. Uh, so we have a global value chain and we can uh, on the same time sort of help other countries to also develop um, their hydrogen value chain and their, their economy at the same time. So the large scale use in these sectors like industry, mobility and power and built environment is expected to go really quickly from 2030 onwards. Uh, and then we take the time between now and 2030 to really scale up the technologies. That's at least the idea. The hydrogen project, this is an old picture. Frank had the recent one. Uh, so then there were even more projects already announced and in development phases. Uh, so I think uh, we can sort of skip that a little bit, but you can look it up at the hydrogencouncil.com where they have all these projects and maps available uh, and inside. And indeed, Europe is really leading if you talk about hydrogen technologies and hydrogen implementation. Uh, and like I said, I think that has several reasons. We have already a lot of hydrogen of uh, natural gas infrastructure available. Our whole industry, for the most part, is already focused on, this, uh, on these molecules that has been implemented because we had natural gas available. Uh, so you want to keep that to a certain extent. You want to make it easy for these industries to develop and to, to change to a decarbonized system and hydrogen can really do that. If you see other areas in the world, it may be less valid or less uh, yeah, opportune to do it. I already talked very briefly in the first one about India, for example. India also has a hydrogen strategy, but for India, it makes much more sense to electrify the rural countries, the rural parts of India by just solar and wind and, and geothermal systems. Uh, and not so much with uh, a natural gas or with a, a hydrogen system. So there it really depends on where are you, uh, what is your, your local geography, how much uh, uh, renewable energy can you generate, how much space do you have to generate. That, that's also different in a lot of these areas. And that relates to what kind of hydrogen systems or what kind of hydrogen projects you actually want to implement. But if you look at this uh, graph and also the one that Frank showed, uh, there's a significant amount of investment being promised in hydrogen technologies. So if we do all that, then we can really scale up these technologies. That's it. I hope there are a lot of questions because I'm always quite quick. <laughs> yes, and that's no problem, Leon, because indeed there are still some questions left. And even if we um, finish a bit earlier, we have a longer break. So um, yeah, worries. Thank you very much. Um, let me first go back to some questions we have not uh, answered yet. Um, and Daniel has rephrased his question. Sorry, let me look for it. Refreshing all the time. Yes. What are the alternatives that decentralized hydrogen production could provide for rural areas and or areas where current high pressure pipeline infrastructure is not yet available? Relative mm. cost of technology plus infrastructural development, under which kind of scenarios could it be techno-economically techno feasible? Um, that, that I think that really depends on your the, the country in question. I mean, for most of these things, uh, I think people need to realize that hydrogen technology, especially electrolyzed technology, it is available and is being scaled up, but it is not really uh, economically available yet. And so first it needs to scale up to become cheaper and then you can make it smaller again, which sounds a little bit weird, but 
that is usually the way it goes. So if you talk about rural development, uh, for example, in India or in, in parts of Africa or things like that, which are not connected to a, ga a gas grid or not connected to electricity grid, I don't think that will hydrogen will be will play a big role there. I think there it is much more feasible and easier to to put in micro grids or somewhat small somewhat bigger grids where you can just make use of the sun and uh, of the wind and geothermal and hydropower and things like that things that are available in the in the in the area then after maybe some development some time you could also think about uh, production system producing hydrogen on a small scale if that is then available uh, but then the price needs to drop significantly before you can do that uh, so i don't think that, that is very feasible now and uh, within a decade or so that could be feasible later on if that's still the case if we don't by then have other means of, of flexibility of storage of putting intelligence in the grid that is more suitable for that location Exactly. Clear. Um, you spoke about technologies of production and storage, but not on technologies for consumption. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the consumption is now. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that was just now. Yeah, so the consumption part is basically indeed the uh, yeah. What you want, like I said, what you want to do is, for example, especially for industrial purposes, you want to make sure that the or ideally you would like to decarbonize in such a way that for these industrial users, it is easier to switch so that they don't have to invest in completely new systems. Eh? For example, steel manufacturing, it is possible to make steel with electricity. It's already been done in Japan, even on scale with some arc lightning uh, electricity systems where, where you have very high heat and can still melt steel or make steel also with the electricity system. But it's not something that is very common that is also not something that is very cheap. So in that sense, it makes sense. It, it would be better if we can, for example, uh, provide hydrogen to the steel manufacturers, green hydrogen, so that they don't really have to change their system completely. Uh, I think that is the main thing for these use technologies, especially for industry, for built environment uh, and for heating. It may be possible to put in fuel cells in your cellar, for example, to make electricity when, when it is cheap, uh, to store hydrogen, I mean, when it is cheap, for example, when electricity is cheap, and then later on use it again, or to use it directly in a heater. So that's something in the Netherlands, for example, a lot of people heat their house with a central heating system. It is run on natural gas. With some adaptation, you can run it on hydrogen. So that makes it much more easier for the consumer to uh, use uh, hydrogen and not invest in a, something else uh, like a, like a electricity electricity driven heat pump or something like that. Mm. Okay. Another interesting question from La Laima of Lima. By the way, there are some energy or electrical markets where the energy prices do really get negative, like what happened in, in Chile and of, in, in Germany. Mm -hmm. Since the cost of the energy is under the marginal costs, well, green hydrogen can have a good chance to take off. On the other hand, if the energy prices get steep, <clears throat> why would hydrogen be a good idea? Taking into account the first talk of today, um, a need of an energy seasonal storage would be, would be still required. Yeah. Yeah, I think from the beginning onwards, when people were, were really looking into hydrogen as a as a yeah as a, an energy carrier, that was a lot was already talking about. Okay, what if you have excess electricity or renewable electricity available? Then you can use it to make hydrogen, and then vice versa, you can put it back on the grid if you have a higher price for electricity. But I think that that situation where you have negative pricing is by circumstance and not by design. So they, it only you you could, in theory, uh, predict it with weather patterns and things like that, and with with produ production patterns. But in the end, do you you cannot really make a business case on that. So uh, hi hydrogen, green hydrogen, can take off indeed if it's a very low cost of electricity. But then it needs to be by design. It needs to be over a certain amount of time per year that that is the case. Otherwise, why invest in a green hydrogen system? if you're not sure if you can run it for a minimum amount of time. So uh, 
in that yeah this is difficult to 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 do i think uh, to, on based on a, a negative price and on the other hand what i also said is why would people or maybe governments will do it but why would businesses invest in wind parks or solar parks or things like that if they have a negative price all the time i mean that would be very hard to do uh, i don't cannot imagine a business case where that is that is uh, suitable so that can even hamper the development of this kind of technologies and actually stimulate it. Okay. Uh, good question from Neto um, about the, looking at the entire chain. Do you think the amount of CO2 emissions during the manufacturing of lithium battery in uh, electric, electric vehicles is really high, which doesn't make it really clean as we claim? Yeah, yeah, that's always that's a good the discussion. You really have to look at the whole chain on that. Uh, and it could indeed be that CO2 emissions during the lithium ion, also during the mining of the lithium, is, is relatively high. But the thing is, of course, you have to compare the lithium ion uh, electric vehicles with a uh, combustion engine. And if you, so you talk about the lifetime of those two, then even if you plug it in in a coal fired power plant, it is still much more favorable than uh, than using a, a diesel over this, the, the 20 years time, simply because of the efficiency of the diesel and the efficiency of the, the petrol car, which is very low. Uh, so you might have a spike of CO2 emission during the lithium ion battery manufacturing, but you will probably earn it back over the lifetime of the car compared to the, the, the internal combustion engine. To talk about hydrogen that may be, well, hydrogen does not really uh, a fuel cell car is also an electric car. So, of course, you don't need a big battery for that. You only have a small battery, but it's still fuel. It is still an electric vehicle. You still require this almost the same amount of production uh, emissions during the production of the car. You also need some other special materials uh, in a fuel cell that you don't need in a lithium ion battery. Uh, so, in the end, it, it may be almost similar to the production of an electric car and the production of a fuel cell car. So, even there, and um, we really have to look at this over the complete lifetime of the, all these systems and then it makes sense good You're talking about this spike and sometimes we first you need to spike that's what we've seen uh, for example in other countries um and i think it's also in line with with the plans of china first they they, they say after 2030 that they're, they're going to try and meet the climate goals but first they need a spike in order to produce all this renewable uh, energy technologies is, is that what you're saying yeah. No, no, what I'm saying with the spike is that there are parts of uh, you're doing something because it's cleaner, so it has less uh, CO2 emissions than, than the, the alternative, uh, yeah. in this case, the internal combustion engine. But during the production uh, system, you also do something that that actually uh, uh, pr yeah, produce more CO2 than you would ideally like. But then yeah. still you have to look at the whole chain. Yeah. Okay. And then it may still be very positive. I think what you're talking about is more in terms of a grand economic development type of thing, which is a, a whole different story, because then you're, um, this, 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 if you talk about GHG emissions, then Europe and, and the United States were the ones that historically did the most. But if you talk about how much GHG emissions there are currently being emitted, then China is number one, uh, and even Europe is somewhere in the middle, so to say. But that does not, uh, discharges from the responsibility to do something about it but then we still have to make sure that even the Chinese and also other developing countries are also being on board with this because it's a global problem and it's not a problem of one country yeah going back to um the end users and hydrogen in the built environments heat and power for buildings do you mean changing the existing central heating which burns currently gas by burning hydrogen and if so do you think it's better to burn this energy carrier or would it be better to call all electric by means of a heat pump? Yeah, there's a several questions here one, so to say. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it depends on what you have already. So if you have a connection with a natural gas grid, like in the Netherlands, where 96% of all the households are connected to a natural gas grid, then it makes sense to exchange that with, with, with green hydrogen. And then just that may not be the most efficient in terms of energy efficiency, perhaps, but it is it is much more easier, much more acceptable for people to do it, because otherwise you ask uh, a consumer 
to put in a heat pump, which costs 15,000 euros compared to adjusting and buying a new uh, central heating system on hydrogen for 1500 euros. So that's a very, there's a, a large difference in, uh, in the price. Um, it doesn't necessarily have to be in your house burning uh, hydrogen. You can also indeed make it a regional system. Uh, so make it uh, like, a, like a, a heat network or something like that, either by hydrogen, burning hydrogen directly in some kind of gas fire, well, used to be gas fire turbine, or maybe uh, with a fuel cell, making it electric and then putting, putting it to everybody's house. That's also possible. But it really depends on your, your, your system, on your, okay. the, the country where you are. But you do see uh, a role for hydrogen in, in the built environment, uh, a role for hydrogen in houses. Yeah. And also and in heat networks compared to indust industrial networks where heat is also required, yes. Okay. And I would also like to refer to a message from uh, Wilm Hazenberg in the beginning of the chat. I will um, put it in the chat again. He's, um, he's now oh, he's also referring to it. So thank you, Willem. I'm working on, a, on um, one of the projects in the Netherlands in where they are testing hydrogen in the built environment. And he's sharing his insights. It's a whole thing. Also in the northern part of the Netherlands, also part of the Heaven Project. He's sharing his insights um, uh, and uh, the lessons learned so far on this uh, on this research. The link is in the chat. Thank you, Willem. Okay. Um, what is the ideal? We have uh, nine more minutes. What is the ideal physical distance, kilometers or miles, actually doesn't matter, between the source of renewable energy and a green hydrogen plant? <laughs> as close as possible. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, it's really the case. Like the beginning, uh, so you would like ideally to make uh, but it really depends on on your yeah where you can do it. Uh, if you talk about, I mean there are. And for example, for some of the the natural extraction platforms to repurpose to uh, the wind parks, for example, scale wind parks, and they can trend, you can use the same pipe. And the applications are more related to decarbonize rather rather other uses. If a country isn't so industrialized, then definitely it is a better idea to produce hydrogen export rather for internal consumption, right? Yeah. Yeah, I think that's the case. Uh, indeed, did, did we are talking about all this in, in terms of decarbonization, uh, like we said in the beginning. So if you emit a lot of CO2, then you probably do it because you have a large industrial footprint or you're a very developed country or things like that. Then you really need to change that up with, for example, hydrogen. Uh, but if you don't have that, then indeed it's better to leapfrog to all these other technologies that are available to build your grid for electricity grid for your own consumption, for example, based on the best available technologies on the most smart available technologies, then you don't have the same problem that we have, which is we have a dumb grid and we need to deal with the dumb grid. So they don't, people that are developing that grid at the moment don't have to deal with that. So then indeed you can say, let, let's transport it, let's export it because we are probably going to need it uh, in the future and are willing to pay for it. So then especially it is a good idea to export it, yes, and not use it. No, exactly. Yeah. Uh, question from Ailey Winkler, all in catch lock. Thank you very much, Ailey. It's, <laughs> it's a very important question. Yeah. Uh, electricity generation. Do you see a way of generating electricity from natural gas via fuel cells while increasing hydrogen content in the grid from zero to 100% hydrogen? This is... Yeah, it is a slightly different technology. Yeah? So uh, using fuel cells for, for, for methane, that's possible too. Uh, but it's slightly different than, of course, using hydrogen. So I don't, I, I, to be honest, I don't really know if there has been any testing on a, on a, a blended or how much blend these fuel cells can actually take. Uh, so I have to look that up, but it could be an interesting concept to already, um, yeah, again, allow hydrogen on the grid with natural gas and to see if we can then indeed also change the end use part by already in, uh, implementing fuel cells. 
but then a fuel cell that can take both. Probably there have been any tests, but maybe I'm not aware of it, but that's uh, indeed could be a very interesting concept. How much efficiency NH3 um, ammonia convert to hydrogen? From NH3 to, to hydrogen? Um, I have to look it up. Yeah, yeah, yeah I, have, I have to look it up. Okay. Yeah. Okay, we're uh, wrapping up. Last questions. Okay, it's more about the how to separate when using the natural gas pipeline for transporting the hydrogen, uh, as said, 20%, maximum 20% uh, mixture. How do you separate natural gas and what do you do with natural gas? Um, when you just normally you have 100% natural gas, that's at least the system I was referring to. So normally mm -hmm. you have 100% natural gas that you sort of change on, on the heating value that you have in your country. And in this case, you add 20% more um, hydrogen to it. So then you always have a blend. Uh, so you just in, you just inject less natural gas and more hydrogen to get to the same volumetric uh, uh, mm -hmm. the volume that you require. So you don't need to separate it later on. Um, the, the idea here is that the systems that you have at the end of the pipe can take this mixture. So not necessarily separating it after at the end of the pipe again to use either 100% hydrogen or 100% natural gas. That is not the idea. That may be possible, but that is not uh, what I was referring to. So yeah, that's uh, yeah, yeah. You don't need to separate. No. Um, what about using hydrogen as a storage for a solar system instead of using batteries or melt melted salt storages? Um, does hydrogen is the winner here? Yeah, that's. It is, um, um, it is it, it, the idea of high, green hydrogen, especially if you talk about storage, that is the case. Eh? So you're, you're, you're indeed using the solar energy, for example, and then if you have excess of that, then you're going to convert it to hydrogen and then you can use it for something else. That's all point. Uh, so that is probably always going to be cheaper than using batteries at the moment, especially if you talk about large scale. If you talk about a lot of energy, then that's the cheaper. If not, then uh, you can use a battery for small scale changing flexibility, that kind of thing. And the melted salt storage is also slightly different because there's thermal heat and thermal heat needs to go to a turbine and the turbine needs to make electricity again. So I think it overall efficiency is probably not going to be very good and also not for, for uh, hydrogen. So maybe that's a bit 50-50. <laughs> Um, I will ask last question. Daniel, I will come back to your question uh, later um, at the end of the day. Um, last question then, uh, from uh, also from Kabanga. What is the feasibility of a micro green hydrogen plant, for instance, to decarbonize a mining region for the developing country? Yeah, that, that, that could be high, but it, yeah. really, it really depends on if you need the hydrogen then. So if you have a mining region and, uh, and then you need to see, okay, what type of, of energy am I using there at the moment? So then the investment is either in the changing the system to something that runs only on electricity and then adding renewable electricity. Or if you go to green hydrogen, you need to add renewable electricity anyway, the, the, the generation part with a fuel cell and then using that system later on. So that this depends, really depends on what you require in that that mining region and how much, uh, what the volume of that is. Yeah, thank you very much, Leon. To all, thank you very much for your questions. There are many questions, even so many that we haven't answered all of them. Don't worry, I, uh, I try to make sure we answer all the questions during the course. If not today, then later on, we will write them down. So please keep asking your questions. Uh, Leon, thank you very much for so far. Um, we will see you at yep. the end of the day. Yeah. Uh, when we're closing off and uh, have a small discussion if there's still time. Uh, for now, we're going to have a break of 30 minutes and we come back at 12.45 Dutch time, sharp, or at 13.45 Israeli time. Uh, see you soon. Leon, thanks once again. Yeah, thank you very much, guys, for all the good questions and let's have a good discussion at the end of the day. Yes. No. <clears throat> yeah.
מכיר, יש פה רק טעות אחת זה ש...
מעולה. Okay, let's move on. Thank you all for coming back. I hope you had a good, it was a short lunch, but a good lunch to have some energy for the last part of today. Um, before we move on with the presentation from uh, Roland Berger about hydrogen valleys, <clears throat> we have some time to answer the remaining questions. As I said, there are many questions and not all of them have been answered yet. Um, there are about seven, eight questions, quite specific, uh, Leon. Um, yeah. Once again, if, and as you said, if you're not managed to, to do um, answer the questions straight away, um, we will send the answer to you later. Um, a question I missed, but it's a very um, good question from um, Nicole. Why does the CAPEX, um, oh yeah, Leon, to, to give uh, to uh, upfront, um, the, the Questions vary very, very much. It's about uh, <laughs> about production, even about uh, economics. So um, it's a <clears throat> range of questions. Um, first question from Nicole: Why does the CAPEX vary so much between countries up to factor two? The CAPEX. <clears throat> now, yeah, <clears throat> to a certain extent, that has to do with, of course, local conditions. So. You know, if you uh, if you buy equipment in Europe or you buy equipment in China or you buy equipment in uh, in India, then the, then it is less in those countries than it is in Europe. <clears throat> so not, I mean, there's a global commodity market, obviously. So steel and things like that have the same price or almost the same price, mm -hmm. but wage, labor, and things like that. That's why it's uh, it's cheaper in some countries. And it's more uh, maybe is the the, the apex, <laughs> yeah. But the, 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 the OPEX is indeed very different, but that's more to do with the local conditions. Yeah, okay. So indeed the price for labor is a, is a large variable for the CAPEX. Yeah, and what she was meaning in the Denmark, I think, and between the European countries, why that's different. Yeah. But there's also a difference in, in, for example, subsidy schemes and things like that. It probably has more to do with that than it has with the, yes. the actual price of the equipment. Yeah, exactly. Okay, thank you. Okay, question from Ian Kaplan. Uh, thoughts about the recent Cornell and Stanford University re reports that using blue hydrogen for heating has 20% higher greenhouse gas emissions than using natural gas. But is it even worth investing time or resources in blue hydrogen if there is no real environmental benefit, especially in the light of the urgency of to change as reflected in the IPC report? Yeah. I don't know that report, but uh, if that is indeed the case, then obviously it is, there's no use in in uh, in exploring that option. What may be the case is that uh, that is also what has come out now with some of this, the carbon capture and storage systems, that they actually leak more than mm -hmm. they are uh, than everybody expected. So the overall capture rate is much less than uh, than promised. Usually they promise about ninety five percent, but then overall. Uh, it may be 60. So if that is the case, also you add that on a natural gas steam reforming, methane steam reforming, and you add 60% capture, then, and also the fact that you need more hydrogen to uh, have the same heating value, the same energy value that you do with natural gas, then you probably come out not very good. That's true. So it really depends on what kind of technologies you have, you implement, and how much the efficiency of those technologies actually is in real life. Uh, I think just to add, that is maybe in general the problem with these intermediate technologies like blue hydrogen. It is not necessarily um, the best option for the environment, uh, but it can be a good option to start off the hydrogen economy and to get everybody used to the fact that you are, uh, um, yeah, that there are different ways of doing it. Yeah, exactly. <clears throat> Autolysis. 
um, it was one of the slides, photolysis as, an, as another method for hydrogen production, which is chemically not very feasible since photolysis is mainly for utilizing carbon and producing glucose, oxygen and hydrogen as products. So the main focus on photolysis should be carbon capture instead of hydrogen production. And meanwhile, combine photolysis with electrolysis towards decarbonization. <laughs> this is going very specific in the technology I'm not really familiar with. So I don't okay. think it's a good idea to, for me to answer that question. No, no problem. Yeah. <laughs> um, Frank, in the beginning, was referring to this $6 per MMBTU comparison. Uh, <clears throat> and um, uh, there's a question about it. $6 per MBTU comparison are regional hot price in the matured LNG trading market. So while keeping mm -hmm. per kilowatt hydrogen coal, are we are we assuming some market efficiency and price discovery aspects? Uh, <laughs> I need to can you, re, can you do it again? The last part? I think yeah. I missed it. No, yeah. no, no, no problem. Um, so while keeping this two dollar per kilowatt, uh, sorry. $2 per kilo of hydrogen coal, mm -hmm. are we assuming market efficiency or a price discovery aspect? Um, I think it's just a comparison, to be honest. So in, in that case, you know, we know that, that per MBBTU, these natural gas prices vary, and it depends on where you are, how much they, they cost. So indeed, in a mature market, it may be less than in a market that still needs to, uh, to mature. Yeah, uh, but here we're just talking about the comparison. I mean, ideally, you would like people, you would like your hydrogen price per kilogram or per MBBTU to be similar to LNG or natural gas price. So that's what we are sort of aiming for, to yeah. to get that there. And maybe the interesting fact is that at the moment, because there's still, um, yeah, the recovery from Corona has also sparked a higher natural gas price. Yeah, mm -hmm. So if you look at the TTF price or the price in Asia, it's, 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 it has been gone up significantly. And there you're coming into a range where also green gas, so biogas and uh, gas from gasification also becomes feasible in terms of price. So in the, if that, of course, it's a bit of a conundrum. Uh, if you have a high natural gas price, then you, the, the more expensive renewables come into play. Yeah. Uh, so it's, yeah, that, that I think is just a, a point in the horizon that we want to aim for. So Festro Russo <clears throat> asks about how do you see the economics of storing and transporting hydrogen in solid forms through a carrier? Um, well, the storage and the the uh, the transport part is is cheaper in that sense. Mm -hmm. You know, storing storing a liquid or uh, is always better than doing it by a gaseous form, as, uh, because then you don't have to uh, compress it and you don't have to do all those kind of things. But Overall efficiency-wise, but also cost-wise, it's a different story, yeah? because you have to convert the hydrogen to, uh, for example, ammonia or something like that, uh, and that costs additional energy and additional money. So the overall efficiency in energy terms may be a little bit better because you transport it much better, but within the whole total system cost, the transport is not that high, not that expensive. And so the conversion between one form to the other form is more expensive and requires more energy than the part that is the transport and the storage. <clears throat> okay. Um, this question was from uh, Daniel and I said I will postpone this question. Um, what about the discussion of e-fuels, the e-methanol, e-synthetic natural gas, etc. As energy can as energy carriers made from green hydrogen that have both a lower overall efficiency of conversion to end use and create a potential to be directly used in the existing infrastructure due to less safety, technology, economic requirements when relative to hydrogen. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but that is or it's a step. So the hydrogen in these in these e-fuels uh, or the, the production of these e-fuels is usually in the intermediate is hydrogen. So you're either going to use it directly and try, you know, uh, put in the process in such a way that you go from electricity to that fuel, or there's an intermediate in the form of, for example, hydrogen to go from hydrogen to that fuel. And I think in general, if you talk about this kind of systems, it really depends on where do you put the price? Where is the cost 
that that you have to pay in the overall system cost it, it makes no sense usually because it's you know the, if you lose a lot of efficiency you lose a, you have to add energy you have to add cost of all these things to make them happen but if you compare it to whatever they are doing now and how much do they need to invest to change that system then it can economically speaking make sense and also because if you have indeed for example very low electricity prices that we also talked about briefly that is possible to you know that doesn't really matter how much uh, operational because your operational cost is very low so then you can maybe do that because you already invested in the capex but from a complete system point of view it's always better to shorten the chain as much as possible to go from whatever you're producing in this case green electricity to whatever you're doing which is using the green electricity but it can be that there in between there's a lot of things you can do to make it easier for that system to work exactly thank you very much <clears throat> i think um we answered now uh, most of the questions i and i see also uwe already uh, joined the meeting uh, uwe can you hear us yes indeed perfect uh, leon uwe, thank you once again and uh thank you. welcome uwe let me first introduce you before um before um, you can um, start your presentation. <clears throat> Uwe, um, Uwe Weichenhain uh, is partner at uh, Roland Berger. It's a large German consultancy and um, he, he um, focuses on energy and infrastructure. He's an expert in new technologies that drive the transition towards sustainable infrastructure, including offshore wind, power transmission, gas, LNG, and hydrogen. Uh, Uwe has a cross-discipline background. He holds a master in industrial engineering and a business administration from the Technical University in Hamburg. Uh, Uwe is also one of the authors of the uh, report on hydrogen valleys, which we have shared with you all. And as I said, some of you will probably have read at least partly. And that is also the base of our case that we're going to work on tomorrow. Uh, with, without further ado, uh, the floor is yours. Uwe, thank you very much. So Joachim, uh, thank you very much for this kind intro. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, really exciting times for people that work like myself in the hydrogen industry. Uh, strong momentum in the market. Yeah? Ambitious hydrogen strategies have been issued by many governments across the globe. This morning, the UK government also issued its strategy, ambitious targets also here, five gigawatts by 2030. And what we experience uh, in, in our work as management consultants is uh, that industry really shows genuine interest in hydrogen. And I think that's very important. So new projects are being announced on a weekly basis. Project sizes get bigger and bigger. Uh, announced project capacity actually tripled to more than 150 gigawatt over the last 12 months. Uh, and I, th I think this shows uh, the potential of this technology. And many of the new projects that have been announced actually qualify uh, to be a hydrogen valley. And I have the pleasure to introduce the hydrogen valley concept to you today. We at Roland Berger recently supported the FCHJU in mission innovation in setting up the hydrogen valley platform. Uh, but we are also currently supporting a number of large scale developments at feasibility stage at the moment, like most projects in Europe and the Middle East. So I will focus today in this session uh, on the lessons learned from hydrogen project development, both in the, in the context of the Hydrogen Valley platform, but also in the wider context of hydrogen project development. So Jochen, uh, do you share the presentation or uh, I, I do it myself? Uh, how do we run this? I would prefer if you share it yourself. Sure. Can you, can you see my screen? Yeah, it's not full screen yet, but I do see the screen. Presentation not uh, yes, there you are. Yes, perfect. Just a second. Yes, it works. Good luck. All right. So, uh, gentlemen, uh, first of all, ladies and gentlemen, what is a hydrogen valley? Uh, although 
the concept as such and the concepts that uh, have been developed so far are quite unique and always depend on the on the specific regional context and the objectives. We define four common characteristics. First of all, they need to be large in scale. So it's a project that goes beyond R&D and demonstration and really has at least a mid double digit euro million investment size. Yeah, so large in scale uh, is the first criterion. Second, uh, it needs to be a clearly defined regional scope. Yeah, so hydrogen valleys are ecosystems that cover a specific geography uh, that can be a very local focus, uh, say a major port and the hinterland, but it can also be a specific region in the country or a transport corridor, uh, for example, a waterway. Uwe, is it possible for you to put it in presentation mode, please? Okay. Thank you. Better now? Yes, thank you. So the second element is the geographical scope. Uh, then uh, the third element uh, is the very broad value chain coverage. So typically, hydrogen valleys really uh, cover the production part, the transport part, and various end uses. And then uh, the fourth important element is uh, the supply for various, uh, various uh, end uses. Uh, for example, the mobility sector, but more increasingly so also uh, the industrial sector. So in the past, we have mostly seen demonstration projects focusing on single applications, and now hydrogen valleys are really the next development step meaning uh, they focus on entire value chains and also show the, the full potential of hydrogen as an energy vector. So uh, the driver for hydrogen valleys development fall into three categories, so environmental, economic, and social. Uh, of course, uh, it's important uh, that hydrogen valleys contribute to the climate policies, reduce local emissions, and also improve the quality of living in those regions. But uh, the overall picture really uh, goes beyond that. And very often uh, industrial policy elements also play a major role here. So this is about transition of sectors that are today very dependent on, on gray industries and hydrogen valleys help uh, those, uh, those uh, regions to uh, secure employment and manage the transition towards a green economy. And then of course, there's also a, solid, a social element of hydrogen valleys pointing towards social acceptance of the technology. So if we sum this up, then hydrogen valleys really provide a very strong proof point that the, te that the technology is ready and that the, that the synergies yeah, uh, in hydrogen development coming from the valley concept really materialize. So over the last couple of months, uh, we had the pleasure of working together with more than 30 hydrogen valleys worldwide. Those uh, hydrogen valleys are located across the, blo the globe. You see an overview of, uh, of the, uh, on the left-hand side of the chart here. So of course, a strong focus is in Europe, yeah, in Europe, including uh, Germany, France, uh, the Netherlands, uh, the UK, Denmark, uh, Southern Europe, so Portugal and Spain, uh, and Italy as well. Uh, but there are also other regions where uh, hydrogen valleys have, de have developed over the last months, including Asia Pacific uh, and the US uh, and also South America. So on the hydrogen valley platform, if you had the chance to, uh, to review that already, you will find a unique set of data really concerning uh, those projects. So the project fundamentals, so the locations, investment and production volumes, the business models, organization status and timelines, but also the specific value chain coverage and technologies used, the project barriers and some best practices from real ongoing uh, project development. So I will not go into the specifics of each single project, but what I would like to do is, is to show a brief set of numbers or figures to characterize the existing hydrogen valleys. So very much in line with the hydrogen valley concept, the the valleys we looked at typically cover a broad range of value chain activities. So almost all hydrogen valleys, 85% of, of the hydrogen valleys uh, focus on hydrogen production, uh, but also transport and storage. 
And on top of that, many of the, of the valleys also engage in primary energy production, so the new power uh, as, as the source for green hydrogen production. So, and this also reflects the current uh, state of the market development. If you look at hydrogen projects today, uh, this is still a very captive market environment, meaning that there is no established free trade of, of hydrogen, meaning uh, to make a project feasible, uh, you also need to take care of uh, the offtake uh, and the transport conversion and storage part uh, to make it work. So uh, what, what we see developing also in terms of large scale projects is really an integrated approach ranging from the upstream activities to the midstream activities to the downstream activities in a, in a consortium setup. And we will come to that later uh, in, a, in, in more detail. Well, uh, the focus of hydrogen valleys is very much on green hydrogen production. Well, green hydrogen production, why? Uh, because it's the only true zero carbon solution uh, emitting less than one kilogram of CO2 per, uh, per kilogram of hydrogen. If you compare that, uh, and I just followed the discussion in the Q&A section, uh, to, to blue hydrogen, it really depends uh, on the projects you look at, uh, but uh, you would have at least four kilograms of CO2 per kilogram of hydrogen there. So blue hydrogen uh, is, is not a true zero alternative, though it can, of course, uh, contribute to the transition. Uh, because the, uh, the, the, the massive scale of renewable energy required for green hydrogen production uh, puts a real challenge to uh, the ambition levels that have been set by governments worldwide. And this is something uh, we, we really experience in our uh, current project development work on behalf of, of industrial project developers. Well, uh, in terms of uh, technologies, uh, there is a strong focus on uh, PEM uh, that is still at industrialization scale, uh, though many of the large projects really uh, bet, on, bet on alkaline. Uh, why is this the case? Uh, alkaline is much longer on the market, so uh, the performance guarantees on the technology uh, are, are more credible, with, which makes the bankability of those projects easier. Uh, but we see but, but we see, of course, uh, that uh, yet, yet at the feasibility stage, many of the large scale developers really look at both options and have not made up their mind uh, where to focus on uh, when the final investment decision is due, say, in two, three years from now. So at the moment, it's really uh, an open race and we need to see uh, when, when, when the first uh, final investment decisions for, uh, for large scale developments take place. So the midstream part, uh, of course, uh, very important, uh, especially when you look at, well, um, the, the, the need for hydrogen uh, transport uh, that will emerge, uh, at least in the mid run, because of the limited potential for hydrogen production uh, close to the offtake site. Well, um, at the moment, if you look at the projects that are uh, ongoing, uh, there is still lots of trailer transport um, based on gaseous hydrogen, uh, based on liquid hydrogen. Uh, but of course, if you look at it in a, in a bigger international picture, uh, large scale developers look at uh, ammonia, look at liquid H2, look at carrier technologies like LOHC uh, to manage the transport uh, and to, to, to bridge the gap uh, from the production locations with with low renewable energy costs to the off-take locations uh, that are often uh, far away from, from those uh, production locations. Looking at downstream, so there is a legacy business, if you will, of hydrogen valleys, uh, very much focused on uh, mobility applications. Uh, if you look at the situation, say, five to 10 years ago, uh, there was lots of focus of, uh, on, uh, on the mobility segment, so hydrogen for captive fleets, taxi fleets, car fleets, bus fleets, um, truck fleets, commercial vehicles. And based on that, on those demonstration projects, um, the hydrogen valleys really developed and added further, further off-takers uh, in the proximity to their portfolio. Uh, but there is still a lot of focus on uh, mobility applications, though we see in the market, of course, that recently there is a shift towards industrial off-take especially for the very large development projects uh, where you need a, a large scale off-taker in place uh, that guarantees the off-take of say 
uh, 40, 50 percent of the production volume to make sure that you really uh, have production volumes at scale and can manage the industrial ramp up of, uh, of your project. Well, if you look at the uh, investment sizes, uh, not, not much surprising. Uh, the smaller projects tend to be mobility focused, whereas the larger projects with, a, with an investment volume of more, more than a billion euro tend to be industry and energy focused. Uh, so very often uh, with a uh, off taker, uh, a prime off taker in in the chemicals industry, in the pet in petrochemicals industry, and in the and the steel industry, uh, and then of course other off takers um, in in other sectors uh, in the mobility space, uh, where the the willingness to pay is typically higher, and and, and therefore of course these these off takers really uh, contribute to an interesting uh, business case after all. Uh, when it comes to the costs of the current developments, uh, I think we, we, we see a picture that is very much aligned with the, with the current market environment. So uh, local production projects, smaller projects, type of demonstration, type of uh, size up to, uh, up to one megawatt, uh, up to two, five megawatts typically have uh, costs in the range of uh, of five uh, five euros per kilogram and up. Uh, if you look at the very large scale developments, of course, um, the, the the target of those projects is to uh, arrive at, at production and transport and storage costs uh, below three to four euros uh, to make it well a, a level playing field with conventional technologies. Of course, taken into account regulatory measures, so much higher uh, CO2 prices uh, than we see today, and uh, also other regulatory measures. So uh, fixed quotas, um, carbon contracts of difference that also play a major role when it comes to the commercial offtaking uh, and commercial business case of such projects. And this is also another very important element and also a shift in the market, whereas uh, five years ago, uh, the, the focus was really much on R&D and demonstration, uh, where of course, uh, of course, the production costs and the and the landed costs at the pump played a certain role. Uh, there, there was still uh, a certain willingness to to fund uh, those activities, uh, also to uh, to a large extent. Whereas we see today in this industrialization and and, and uh, ramp up phase that. Uh, this is no longer possible. Uh, I mean, there is lots of money uh, that will fly, that will go into the hydrogen development uh, outlined in the in the policies uh, of the of the EU and different national states. But at the same time, it's clear uh, when we are talking about a one giga giga project and more, uh, then of course, um, as a, as a as a policymaker, uh, you you cannot get to funding funding volumes of of fifty percent of the lifetime cost and more because the the amounts of money you need for that are massive. And this is why we have the shift in the market really towards commercial development and commercial development that ultimately leads to a return on invest for, uh, for developers. And also, of course, raise the interest of, of uh, investors, strategic investors like oil and gas companies, like utilities companies, but also financial investors, infrastructure funds in the field. And we are really only at the beginning of this development. So when it comes to the well, learnings, yeah, um, there, there is a couple of, of trends we see in the market. First of all, uh, projects are at the moment at feasibility stage. Yeah? So what we can expect of the next years is, first of all, further an increasing number of projects and announcements. Uh, and this is what we see every day. Uh, but what we will also see is, is a final investment decision for larger projects. Uh, it by, by middle of the decade, um, we, we already see now that, uh, say, the, the medium size of projects that are currently in implementation is, well, say, uh, 10 to 20 megawatts, uh, where it was uh, 2 to 5 megawatts uh, one to two years ago. And we expect this to, uh, this to be ramped up to, say, 100 to 200 megawatts in two years from now. And then, of course, uh, looking at the second half of the decade, we also expect investment decision for much larger projects. Well, a uh, second trend is uh, that 
the focus shifts from the from the policy or public side to the investor side. There's lots of appetite for for projects. There's also lots of money in the market at the moment due to, due to the very uh, relaxed uh, yeah, funding policies all over the place of the national banks. So there's lots of money that need to be deployed, and hydrogen is certainly uh, an area of interest for financial investors as well. And the third trend we see is that the hydrogen valley development really gravitates towards three archetypes. Well, the, the first one being a uh, local small scale project typically focused on the mobility space. So uh, this is also the le legacy part of the business. Then uh, the, the second one, uh, which is still local, but in the center of the project is typically uh, an industry. So an off taker, a local off taker for, uh, for hydrogen, uh, like a refinery, uh, like a chemicals plant, uh, like a steel plant. And then you have several other off takers, uh, mobility off takers uh, that also contribute to, to synergies for the overall uh, su supply part of the business. And those projects are typically led by the, by the private sector. And in this space, we really see a lot of new project announcements. So virtually all uh, large polluters, so uh, all large emitters of, of CO2 uh, work on such concepts. Uh, you, you see that under the important projects of European interest scheme in, in Europe, but also in other geographies in the world. So there's lots of momentum in this market. And uh, the third archetype really is the large scale international and export focused uh, project type. Uh, those are typically projects uh, that are located in regions with very low renewable energy costs. So either uh, in, in Southern Europe, Northern Africa, the Middle East, uh, or in the, in, the, in the North Seas, for example, based on offshore wind renewables. And the ultimate goal here is to create a uh, liquid uh, trade market for, for hydrogen um, and, uh, and supply the hydrogen to, uh, to uh, international off-takers. What you need to take into account here is that already now, of course, the production costs in, in uh, good locations for renewable energy are two to three times lower than, for example, in, in, in Germany. Uh, but at the same time, uh, the costs for tra transporting hydrogen without an, uh, in pipeline infrastructure that is already installed are still quite high, uh, typically higher than the production costs. And this is a burden. So transport, transportation storage costs uh, need to come down over the next years uh, to make uh, those projects feasible. Uh, nevertheless, th this is a development we clearly see and that also needs to happen. Uh, due to the limited uh, potential that we see for, for on-site production of hydrogen. Uh, so there's, of course, this is typically not only a space issue, uh, not only a cost issue, but, but first and foremost, also a space issue. So typically there is no space for large wind developments uh, close to uh, industrial sites. Um, same also true for solar developments, hydro developments and the likes. Uh, and therefore you always have uh, a need to transport hydrogen and this will this need will become increasingly important if you look at larger volumes towards the end of the decade. Well let me now come to the perceived challenges of the, the project developers so the, the the project owners that really work on on the feasibility studies of the project now and in part are already working on implementing those projects so first of all, not very surprising. Uh, if you look at the overall challenges, um, we, uh, we have on, on top of the list uh, questions that very much relate to the business case. Uh, so the, the, the commercial business case of the, of the project or the project parts, uh, the overall project funding. Uh, and this is very much related also to the regulatory environment uh, where uh, there is still a lack of perceived experience of authorities when it comes to the permitting procedures, uh, when it comes to safety regulations, when it comes to codes and standards. Uh, but of course, there's also this, reg uh, this regulatory element of price. Uh, at the moment, there is no level playing field for, for green or blue hydrogen uh, in, in, in comparison to conventional solutions, oil and gas markets that make it very difficult from a, from a, commercial, uh, from, from a commercial angle. 
Uh, nevertheless, of course, we see lots of developments uh, when uh, in this space, so the renewable energy directive two implementation, everything we see in the proposal for the so-called Fit for 55 package of the European Commission uh, towards the renewable energy directive three, uh, towards questions like uh, the, uh, the adjustment of the ETS uh, system, um, the, the addition of new sectors like the building sectors, uh, like uh, the maritime sectors to the, to the ETS system. This of course would all help uh, or for example, what we what we have on the table in Germany in terms of international energy relationships under the H2 global scheme that is very concrete in terms of, uh, of contracts for difference for, for hydrogen import and export. Uh, those are the measures really um, project developers need uh, to, to ensure that uh, projects get bankable uh, and cannot only be financed from the, from the policy side uh, but also from, uh, from, from the private investors' side. So, well, having said that, uh, those challenges, uh, they really need to be addressed still uh, on, a, on a policy level, but also on industry level. And uh, to sum this up, really, uh, the key success factors uh, for, uh, for a project developer are first and foremost to find well, off-takers uh, that uh, are willing to pay a decent price and that sign long-term agreements, uh, say, uh, for a duration of, of five to 10 years minimum uh, to make sure that the investment you, uh, you, you make on the upstream and midstream part can really be depreciated over time. Uh, and also to make those projects bankable uh, to allow uh, bank financing for those projects. And this, of course, is very much dependent on the on the adequate legal and regulatory support uh, in terms of carbon pricing, standardization, permitting procedures, and the likes. And typically, at least for this first part of of projects that are currently in the in the wave of industrialization, uh, there is still a public funding support element that that is required. And we see lots of, uh, so to say, um, commitments from governments. Uh, at the same time, we are not yet at this stage where uh, those subsidy schemes are uh, to the extent concrete uh, that they really enable a final investment decision. And this is really something many developers wait, uh, are currently waiting for. Uh, and another aspect, of course, is uh, the technology readiness. Uh, I've spoken about the upstream part, so the, the, the type of, of, of production technology, electrolysis uh, technology to be be applied, uh, but first and foremost, uh, there, there is still a development that needs to be, needs to happen on the uh, on the transport and storage part. So, for example, you, you discussed uh, ammonia uh, earlier. Uh, ammonia, as such, of course, is a very efficient means of transport. Uh, if you need pure hydrogen in the end, a uh, purification rates of 99 percent and up. Uh, though you need uh, you need a uh, ammonia cracking process, uh, you need a purification process, uh, and, and this is all early stage technology with very low TRL levels. So on the transport part, we really see uh, a lot of, of, of technical and development work that still needs to happen. Well, looking a bit at your uh, case uh, case exercise uh, tomorrow. Uh, I would I would like to drive your your attention to uh, a couple of aspects that I believe are really uh, are really important. So the first the first is location um, for hydrogen valley. Uh, the strategic location selection is really is really important. So ideally, you are really in vicinity to a pool of potential hydrogen customers. Uh, you, you ideally also have access to existing infrastructure, for example, pipelines. Uh, and this is also something that is often mirrored in the project announcements you, you, you see and the projects that are being, uh, being implemented uh, at the moment. Very often uh, harbor locations, uh, locations with existing uh, certain types of infrastructure like de de depleted natural, uh, na natural gas networks and, uh, and the likes. So first point you need to pay attention to is relocation. Uh, second point is access to customers. So ideally, uh, for Hydrogen Valley, you have a lead developer in, in your consortium that already has 
very good customer relations uh, to, to off-takers. So an established customer base, if you will, and also a, a track record in, in developing projects and implementing the projects uh, together with multiple partners. And not necessarily in the hydrogen space, but can be in other uh, technologies. So access to customers uh, and experience in project development uh, is, is also an important factor. Then the third, the third aspect I would like to mention is uh, supplier relations. So ideally, uh, in the project consortium, uh, you have technology partners with a strong track record. So on the one hand side, of course, it's, it's, uh, it's good to have, well, uh, new technologies, emergent technologies, in your portfolio at the other hand side for bankability of the projects is also important that you have experienced technology partners and ETCs uh, that can guarantee that, that can guarantee certain performance elements of the equipment and that also have a solid project track record in, in, in developing engineering and implementing projects. Well uh, then the fourth element you need to pay attention to is access to cost competitive renewable power. So essentially, if you look at the business case overall, um, for the production part, roughly 70%, depending on where you are, uh, even higher uh, of, of the costs of the, of the upstream part of, of the project business case is renewable energy. So access to renewable energy is, is, really, is really one of the core, uh, core success factors of, uh, of, of the overall business case. So make sure that you are either in a location where you have very good, very good conditions for renewable energy, uh, or that you can uh, can have access uh, via the grid certificates, whatever. But make sure that you pay enough attention to uh, to the uh, to the renewable energy part. And the the fifth element that is also important in, in, in the context of hydrogen valleys development is is of course access to political decision makers. Well, um, especially in, in, in young markets, uh, we see that there is typically no well, regulatory system in place yet. Uh, some, some countries have, have done some of the homework already. Uh, some other countries are still uh, in, the, in, the, in the very much startup phase, uh, also on the, on the policy and regulatory side. And here we see that uh, a, a powerful project consortium can really drive the market development, uh, also educate policymakers, uh, and make sure that uh, that really uh, the the interest uh, of the of the policy side and the interest of the developer side are aligned. So I would say we uh, we we make a pause here, and go to the Q and A phase. Yes, I think that's a good idea. Thank you very much, Uwe. And there are some questions. Uh, let me pick. We cannot answer all questions, and uh, some questions will be answered during uh, the rest of the summer school. Let me focus on the questions on hydrogen valleys. Uwe, would you like to show some key metrics for mobility focused valley? Metrics in terms of some key metrics uh, for mobility, a uh, mobility focused valley. Yeah, I think I don't get the, um, the question. No, uh, Edward, could you please rephrase the question in the chat? I will ask it later to, um, to Uwe. What is a typical uh, geography in general for a hydrogen valley? Well, uh, a, a typical, uh, Geography, so coming back to the archetypes uh, mm -hmm. I, I showed earlier. So for the uh, mobility, for, for the mobility part, this is typically uh, a, a city or region mm -hmm. uh, that uh, those projects are typically driven by the, by the policy side. So by say uh, public uh, bus operators, uh, public infrastructure operators, the policy side, uh, that have an interest in lower, uh, lowering the overall uh, emissions uh, in the region, uh, coming to archetype two. So the, the, the more industrial focused uh, valley, uh, 
Here, uh, we are talking about the heavily industrialized regions. So to say, for example, taking the example of Germany. Yeah? Um, we are talking about the, the Western region uh, where you have uh, the, the large uh, polluters. So the chemicals industry, the, the steel industry. So the major driver here really is um, the, the off taker who needs to also due to regulatory uh, changes, uh, need to uh, find a solution for the decarbonization of its asset footprint. And this is the development driver for a much broader, uh, much broader uh, valley, uh, including other off takers then as well. Another good example for, uh, for, this, uh, for this archetype too are harbor regions. Uh, very often harbor regions and industrial regions uh, coincide. So we have lots of industrial development in harbor regions. Another good example is, is uh, our regions with, well, uh, existing infrastructure uh, that is no longer needed, uh, for example, in, in the northern part of the Netherlands. Uh, talking about the export case, uh, here we are uh, looking at uh, the regions with uh, superior renewable energy conditions. So in uh, Europe, uh, mostly, uh, the North Seas region, uh, due to very high, load, uh, very high load factors of, of offshore wind, uh, plus uh, the very southern regions, so Portugal, Spain, and southern Italy, very low uh, cost for solar. Yeah. Uh, but then, of course, there's also lots of developments in, in, in Northern Africa, Middle East, that specifically targets the European market. And uh, those are really then, uh, so to say, so to say uh, regional trade markets that are that are developing at the moment. We see the same, for example, in, in Asia, where South Korea and, and Japan are the hydrogen sinks, uh, whereas, uh, whereas Australia is the hydrogen producer. Uh, and the uh, same kind of logic uh, also when you look at the American continent. Yeah, thank you. A question from Laima. Um, we will answer that question uh, tomorrow about uh, stakeholders. Patrick Knubber will uh, address this question. Um, question to you, Uwe. What is the scope for small-scale startup for the Hydrogen Valley concept? Well, so if, if you look at the, so to say, early stage developments of, of Hydrogen Valleys, um, they mostly focused on, on a uh, single application uh, to make sure that you have a certain offtake volume guaranteed. So if you start this up, uh, you could think about different kinds of uh, sector. So once again, this could be uh, a captive fleet operator. Um, now the focus is not so much on cars anymore because I think uh, the, the game is, is lost to uh, electricity for good reasons. Mm -hmm. uh, but what we see, for example, is uh, lots of interest in the uh, logistics space, logistics space around uh, forklifts for, uh, for uh, logistics centers, uh, plus uh, refueling uh, and supply for uh, captive commercial fleets in a certain region. Uh, that could be a good starting point looking at uh, the mobility segment. If you look at the industrial segment, it's pr pretty much everything um, you, you can think of in your specific region. Yeah? I would always look at it, so to say, from an offtake perspective. Yeah, to, to also make it very pragmatic. Uh, if you, it's taken the example of Israel, um, looking, at, looking at the industrial footprint of Israel, I think you can come up with a, with a list of the, so to say, the largest captive off takers you might have in the region, and then think about this as a starting point uh, for a development and thinking about pooling of volume with, uh, with different potential customers. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Shaley, your question is, is also very relevant. I will also uh, ask this question to Patrick tomorrow. Last question to Uwe. Um, um, it's about Africa. What is the feasibility of a hydrogen ferry for a landlocked African country? Well, um, there is, of course, uh, looking at, uh, this is also a, so to say, a field of development I'm quite close to, uh, looking at the developments uh, that are in feasibility stage in uh, Northern Africa and the Middle East. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, country risk uh, plays a role. 
Having said that, I would not rule out the possibility uh, to develop projects there. Um, there is, of course, uh, two things to, you need to distinguish. First of all, uh, there is an own local market developing in those regions because um, those countries uh, very often uh, have a um, industrial uh, development ambition that goes beyond uh, pure commodity supply mm -hmm. but is pointing more towards well uh, use of green hydrogen locally uh, for uh, green product production yeah say uh, why don't move steel uh, well, parts of the steel industry to those countries where you expect uh, green electricity and green hydrogen prices to be much cheaper than uh, than in Europe. So there is a certain, first of all, element of local uh, of local production, and this also then needs to be de-risked locally. And then you have the second case that is basically the export case. Well, why not developing something in in, in Africa uh, and shipping uh, the hydrogen uh, towards the offtake centers in, in Europe? Uh, and this, uh, this very much, much uh, is, is dependent on uh, the transport route and also uh, certain guarantees you can give on the uh, upstream uh, part. And, and here, country risk really plays a major role. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much uh, for this uh, great presentation, but also a great introduction, um, well, to the concept of hydrogen valleys, but also for tomorrow when we're going to work on the case. And we're even better prepared now. Uwe, thank you very much once again. Thank you. Thank you very much and, and have fun. In the we will. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Bye. Bye bye. Rageli, could you introduce our last speaker of today, Achim? So, when we talk about international projects, we talk about three things, in my opinion. One is we talk about the project itself, whatever content it has. The second thing is we talk about the partners that are going to collaborate internationally in order to carry out the project. And the third aspect is the financing. So for that reason, Jochem and I thought that it was also important to expose you um, uh, during the summer school to different um, funding mechanisms that exist. And uh, we will have uh, the first today, and that will be presented by Dr. Achim Eberspecher who is the advisor on international energy uh, R&D at the um, uh, Dutch organization uh, called RVO, which is responsible for the international um, R&D collaboration. For the Israeli people in the audience, this would be the equivalent to the Israel Innovation Authority or the ESIL at the Israel Innovation Authority. And therefore, we will hear about the possibilities that exist in developing uh, joint collaborations through the Horizon Europe project. Dr. Achim Eberspecher is the national contact point for energy for the R&D program Horizon Europe at the Netherlands Enterprise Agency since September 2019. As such, he serves as the liaison person between the Dutch field of energy R&D, Dutch policymakers, and the European Commission. He advises companies and knowledge institutions and connects them to possible partners in other countries. He worked also in the past in Berlin as a research coordinator in political, uh, political um, consulting for the project, the Energy Systeme der Zukunft, the um, uh, term that I think that appears again in, uh, in your PhD thesis, uh, Achim, is futurology, uh, which you carried out uh, at the Leibniz University in Hannover. And um, you also have a master from the University of Nancy too, and the uh, University of Stuttgart. Achim, the floor is yours. Thank you, Achedi, for introducing me and for having me. Can you hear me? That's yes. very good. Okay, very good. Then I share my screen. Okay, can you see it? Yes. Can you put it in presentation mode? Okay. Thank so you. that's it. Okay. Uh, Ube and also you, Racheli, said, uh, give me uh, sometimes, gave me sometimes the keyword funding or money, but I try to make it a bit different. I try to tell the story a bit different of Horizon Europe. Uh, Frank and Leon sketched the scenario we are striving for a climate neutral energy system of 2050 with a significant share of H2 of hydrogen. 
now we we are in another system uh, with in the energy system almost no hydrogen in industry yes uh, in the energy system not a lot and it's not climate neutral by now so we have to get from the system from the nowadays system to a climate neutral system and that relatively quickly therefore we have to speed up and we also have to speed up r d and that's why i will present today the eu's most important instrument for um, speeding up for acceleration of r d and that's the instrument horizon europe the background of that is something uh, frank also told us about it's the goal of the Green Deal, and the core of the Green Deal is um, the mission to become, for Europe, to become the first climate neutral continent by 2050. And the European Commission is proposing to increase the 2030 target for emission reduction to at least 55% from 40%. So these are the cores. That's a uh, policy. And Horizon Europe is an instrument for that. What do I want to say with that? Try to see if you're working with Horizon, with an um, instrument like Horizon, don't see it as a bag of money. So don't, if, if you're um, ask, if you're uh, submitting a proposal, don't ask the European Commission to fund your research. Try to think of otherwise. Uh, try to think you want to help the EU or um, the world to solve problems. And in this case, uh, the problem is easy uh, to, to identify as global warming. How does this instrument, this instrument to solve problems look like? Um, it has three pillars. Um, energy, uh, the hydrogen stuff is mainly located in the um, second pillar in the so-called cluster climate energy and mobility, which has a budget of about 15 billion euro and the whole program has a budget of about 95 billion euro for seven years from um, 2020 to 2027. What are the characteristics of this pillar two? Uh, we have different types of actions. We have a relatively high funding rate of 100% for knowledge institutions for, for nonprofit plus 25% overhead. 70% for companies, and in some cases, uh, 60% for companies in innovation action. So in the, in the projects uh, closer to the market, the focus is always on impact. So at the end of the day, you have to prove that you will uh, contribute to reduce GHG emissions. You will contribute to, um, to creating jobs, to um, also earning money. And it's always a systemic thing and interdisciplinary um, consortia are something which is almost always good and recommendable. Hydrogen within uh, Horizon. Horizon Europe, I said it, uh, it's relatively new. It had a predecessor, Horizon 2020. And there's an important change of uh, how hydrogen is organized within this instrument. Uh, within Horizon 2020, it was exclusively, almost exclusively focused in uh, the FCHJU. Tomorrow, Bart Bieberg will, you, will tell you everything on this, um, on this club, on, on, on this uh, partnership. And now in Horizon Europe, it looks different. It's not any longer um, focused in this um, partnership, which means um, on the horizon Europe for hydrogen, there are more opportunities, but less simplicity. In horizon 2020, you had only the FCHJU with a budget of about 700 million euro. In horizon Europe, we have the um, successor that's clean hydrogen with a budget of uh, about 1 billion euro. So about factor, factor 1.5 but we have a lot of other um, partnerships as well with uh, budgets as well. And so stuff like um, hydrogen for aviation, it's moved to clean aviation, um, hydrogen in industry uh, for steel production, it's moved to clean steel, all that. 
what are the basic conditions to take part? These are three basic con conditions. The first one is you are a party. It doesn't matter if you're a knowledge institution, a university, a company, uh, a municipality, everything is possible. If you're doing R&D, um, which means you are not uh, set putting um, solar panels on roofs, you really uh, are innovating, you are developing something. Second one, you have a project idea matching Horizon Europe topic very well. So you don't have a, a finished project and you, um, you submit a proposal for it. You have to tailor your project to uh, what the European Commission asks for. And three, you don't do that on your own. You have to be part of a consortium with partners from at least three different EU or associated countries. What's an associated country? Um, I come back to that to the associated country. Uh, what are the reasons to take part? Of, of course, access to knowledge, uh, you learn something, you innovate. Um, the collaboration, you, can, you, you get to know uh, new partners if you're a company, also to potential customers, to markets. Uh, it delivers visibility, um, especially for universities, uh, knowledge institutions, it's very popular uh, to put it on the web pages. Uh, a one um, horizon fund grant and uh, last not least it is the the money it is funding uh, so what Uwe said uh, public funding also for the hydrogen well is is required still um, and the top challenge is funding so yeah it is money too but don't see it as a bag of money see it as, as an instrument to solve problems Last point, what is an associated country? Um, I talked a lot about the uh, EU and Europe, but I know the majority of you here are from Israel. Um, so what do you have to do with an European instrument? Israel was a so-called associated country within uh, Horizon 2020. And what my uh, counterpart from Israel, Hage Schwimmer, um, uh, confirmed to me uh, by now Israel is neg negotiating and it's almost sure that Israel will be an associated country in Horizon Europe uh, again. So uh, can be a full partner in everything. And uh, to end with, I have some statistics uh, how successful um, Israel, parties from Israel was where within Horizon 2020. Uh, there were um, 1,664 projects with Israel and partners uh, in it. Uh, 402 projects in collaboration with uh, Dutch uh, entities. The success rate was 12.2%. So that's a uh, very average uh, success rate all over Horizon 2020, it's 12.7. Uh, so uh, you see it's very competitive. Uh, they got about 1.3 billion euro and there are 42 uh, projects from uh, who are related with energy eight uh, collaborating with dutch partners and one fch project with dutch partners in it and normally i always show a nice example uh, it's not necessary here since tomorrow you will get to know about the best example uh, you could uh, you could see uh, the hydrogen valley heaven that's an uh, horizon project funded by 20 million euro uh, from the fch uh, european commission money uh, total budget about 100 million euro that's a very very nice uh, example and you will get to know everything about it last thing if you have questions, ask your national contact point. Uh, in the case of the Netherlands, that's me. In the case of Israel, uh, it's Hagit. Um, you can find all of us via the web page uh, from the European Commission. That's public. And that's it. Thanks for your attention. Rachel, you're muted. Thank you very much, Achim. Um, as we have a few more minutes, um, so we conclude our day. 
I'd like to uh, summarize what we did today. And I will start actually with uh, the point, one of the points made by Aki. And I agree with you, the aim of the international collaboration, which is funded among others by the European projects, such as Horizon Europe, or the FCH joint undertakings, about which we will hear more tomorrow, is to solve global challenges. As we call it in the Netherlands, I told you earlier on, I work for the uh, Netherlands uh, Innovation Network at the Dutch Ministry of Economy and Climate Policy. What we at the embassy here would like to see is the development of international collaboration between Israel and the Netherlands, in which Dutch solutions will solve global uh, problems or challenges. And in this aspect, uh, today we're addressing the energy transition. So this is one of the challenges that we're addressing by this international collaboration. Going back uh, to the beginning, we first heard a few opening words of the ambassador um, to Israel, uh, who fully supports our initiative. And this is not the first initiative Joachim and I um, have developed uh, in the last year and a half. So we're pleased that we have uh, developed a process or uh, some kind of mechanism in which we share information between Dutch and Israeli um, experts. And the uh, summer school is, of course, uh, one of our best examples of this. Afterwards, we had a presentation by Frank Wouters, originally from the Netherlands, who resides in, in the uh, Gulf countries, Saudi Arabia um, and uh, Abu Dhabi, as well as in the Netherlands. He's very active internationally, as you could see from his presentation, was also one of the developers of the um, European Hydrogen Act, uh, which he co-developed together with uh, Professor Ab van Wijk from the Technical University uh, of Delft. So I think that from Frank, we could learn a lot about uh, the hydrogen uh, economy in general and where are we uh, heading uh, to. Then we had two presentations uh, from our colleague Leon Stille, uh, the CEO of the Energy Delta Institute. The first focus again, more in depth about the hydrogen. It's very important to us that you will understand what is hydrogen all about because we would like to develop a hydrogen valley based on our understanding that hydrogen is indeed very important. And it's not just the production and the storage um, and the transportation of hydrogen. It is also what Uwe mentioned a few minutes ago, the offtake, the usage uh, of the hydrogen in the different sectors, such as the mobility, the industry, and uh, the built environment. We also addressed a lot of questions, and this is another role that we take upon ourselves and that is uh, to fill the knowledge gap that exists between the questions that people have worldwide and the Dutch competence and um, expertise that exists. So for that, we are very pleased and Jochem and I decided to devote as much time as needed to address almost all your questions. Then we had a presentation of Uwe Weichenheim, um, who is one of the um, developers of the uh, report of Roland Berger the German company, and based on this report, which we kindly ask you to read if you are joining tomorrow the hands-on uh, part in which you will plan and design a hydrogen valley, we learned about different archetypes, we learned about the choose of the location of a hydrogen valley, we learned what is the leading factor, what could be potential challenges and how can we address them, what is the importance of the international collaboration. Um, I love to study, and one way to study is, of course, to listen, and this is what we did today, but even a better way to learn is uh, to experience, and therefore what we're going to do tomorrow is to experience this ourselves. We will start tomorrow with a presentation of uh, Bart Buick from the Fuel Cell Hydrogen Joint Undertaking, which is a complementary uh, funding scheme uh, to Horizon Europe, also from the European Commission, who funded some of the uh, hydrogen valleys, including, including Heaven, uh, which is established in the northern part of the Netherlands, to which Achim uh, related a couple of minutes ago. We will, will then um, hear uh, an introduction to our hydrogen case from uh, Patrick Knoeven, the architect of Heaven, and uh, Patrick is also on the advisory board of the Israeli-Dutch Innovation Center that we established here at the embassy. Uh, Jochen will introduce the case and then we will divide uh, the groups into 20 uh, breakout, uh, breakout rooms 
and you will be five to six people and you will go through this uh, exercise of designing your own hydrogen valley. We will then reconvene and have a plenary discussion on the case work you did. That is again open also to the listeners and we will then have a uh, look at what we're going to do on day number three. In the name of Jochum and myself, I want to thank all of you. I want to I thank the speakers. I want to thank the Energy Delta Institute, our host. And I want to thank the uh, IT experts that are uh, helping us to make this event as technically, um, uh, how would I say, effective as possible. Avnel and Leo, thank you so much. And we will see you tomorrow morning at quarter to nine Central European time quarter to 10 Israeli time. Thank you, Shalom, and goodbye. Thank you. Recording stopped.